Good morning, internet. It is me, Daniel Schiffman, live here uh, from New York City at uh, New York University at Tisch School of the Arts. Um, I am here, like I often am on Fridays, to present to you. <laughs> oh shoot, hold on, hold on. <clears throat> oh, this went so much better during rehearsal this morning. There's no rehearsal. <laughs> to present to you, <laughs> The Coding Train, a weekly thing on YouTube where I do some coding stuff. Um, and um, I, I, I have an announcement to make, which is that I do intend to keep Friday, most likely, as the day of my live streams going forward. Um, I kind of operate on the academic calendar, um, but it looks like Friday is going to be a free day for me in this spring once NYU classes get going. Um, I will probably alternate, sometimes do a morning, t my time, morning time slot, which is this time right now, around 10.30, 11 uh, Eastern time, and I will sometimes do a later time slot around uh, 3 p.m., 4 p.m., 5 p.m. Um, Eastern time. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of, uh, <sighs> that's the kind of, oh, uh, update that I have. So what's happening today on today's episode of The Coding Train, you may be wondering. Well, I am yet again going to continue my series on building a neural network in JavaScript. Uh, pointless or fruitless as that may be, I'm going to continue it. Uh, I, my, it's my intention to get all the way up to the end of the feed forward algorithm, meaning data into the neural network, output out of the neural network. The training and learning process is something I intend to approach next week. Uh, I am also planning on doing a coding challenge. I'm gonna try to do one co uh, coding challenge per week, at least separate from the usual, uh, whatever sort of tutorial material that I'm doing. And uh, Floyd, what is this called? Well, let me just look up image stippling. And I'll do a Google image search for image stippling. This is what I intend to do, is work on an algorithm that can create an image from just a simple black and white dots. And I'm going to use most likely the, um, 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 the a particular algorithm that's called Floyd, is it Floyd Steinberg, I want to say? Yeah, Floyd Steinberg uh, dithering. And uh, here's a nice Wikipedia page. So I will attempt, I will implement this particular algorithm in processing to get some sort of result uh, like this. Okay, so that's, that's kind of what I have on the agenda for today. <laughs> Any questions? I'm feeling kind of serious this morning, I don't know why. All right, what else? What else is happening? Ah, oh, 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 oh! I have something very exciting to announce. Uh, a viewer uh, uh, at, uh, on, on GitHub, uh, I believe the GitHub name of this particular viewer is Niels Webb. Uh, Niels Webb created an entire new website. So this, ah, why am I not, hold on, bear with me for a moment. Let's make this happen. Let me log in. I'm going to log into my GitHub account so that I'm logged in as I do this live stream today. It's going to take me a minute because I have very high security measures. So the first thing that I need to do is type my username and then I need to go over here to my password manager. Boy, oh, oh, yes, live on the coding train. Me looking up my password. Uh, and then I'm going to reveal it and it's like a really crazy weird string of characters. Uh, then I'm going to do this. Ah, now I need to get my authentication code. <laughs> Hold on with me, everybody. Things I should have done before I started live streaming. Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. Authenticator. Here, waiting music. <laughs> I can't find it. <laughs> Oh, here it is. 461768, verify. Woohoo! Ah, 
<laughs> okay, back. <laughs> I think I might have hurt myself there. All right. Um, so, uh, Niels Webb created, let's go to this uh, repository. This is the repository that you might be familiar with because it's generally where I keep all the corresponding source code that goes with my videos. So for example, if I wanted to look for the source code for Langston's Ant, Langton's Ant, which was a coding challenge I did last week, I would go here under coding challenge and I would go all the way to the bottom and I would find, first of all, I'd be so thrilled to see that in addition to Coding Challenge 89 Langston, Langton's Ant, there is Coding Challenge 89 Langton's Ant P5JS, which even though I said in, I would make a JavaScript version of the Coding Challenge, um, <laughs> I uh, didn't. But uh, if I go to our, uh, the history here, actually if I, I think if I just actually click on that, uh, we will see, we can give a hearty thank you to Vortami on GitHub, who I believe, I mean, Vortami made the last commit to this directory and I'm pretty sure it was Vortami who, uh, if I just go up here to sketch.js and go to uh, history, we can see, yes, this was Vortami who contributed the JavaScript version. So thank you, Vortami. Uh, all right, so, but I, but I digress. Um, so, this is what you might be familiar with. This is where you can find the source code for all the coding challenges. But ah, oh, but oh, what is this new directory I see? Underscore coding challenges, underscore coding challenges. So you might have in the past, oh, I forgot this already, like, oh, I, you want to submit your version of Langton's Ant. You might go here and see that there's a readme and then you could, do a pull request to the readme and add your community variation. <laughs> this, this is now the old system. I'm gonna keep this old system going for a little bit longer because we're still working out the kinks of the new system created by Niels Webb. The new system is if I go back to this underscore coding challenges directory and I look for Langton's ant right here, this is now a markdown file. This markdown file, now it's a little weird to look at. Um, GitHub is attempting to format this markdown file in a nice way for us to look at. I'm just gonna click on raw so we can see it. So this is a particular markdown that is, oh, and I believe actually, oh no, this is correct. Um, I uh, this is a particular markdown that works with a system called Jekyll. And if there's time at the end of live streams, um, well, this live stream, I'm gonna run through a little tutorial about how to set up and run Jekyll on your computer. Jekyll is a engine for templating and building websites with GitHub pages. Well, you don't have to use just GitHub pages with it, but GitHub pages works very well with it. Um, and so what you'll see here is now, there is all this information, right? There is a contribution here that has a title and an author and a URL and another URL, or the URL of the author and a URL of this, the source, so maybe this is uh, the URL of it running online, the source, and you can see there's some other stuff here. What, where, what, what is going on here? This markdown file feeds a new website, which is codingtrain.github.io slash rainbow dash code. Rainbow dash code. Anyway, so you can see here, look at this. This is now the new website that will compile and keep track of all of the challenges, all the tutorials, all of the streams, and in fact, Someday there might be like a big blinking red light on air right now or something when I'm actually live. That's a great idea. And uh, if I go back to coding challenges and um, I click here to the challenge, you can see this is the page now for the coding challenge, which has the video. It has links to the example running in the browser. I know my second laptop is visible. I can get the code. I can see the community contributions, a link to how to add your own version, and even all of the links that were referenced or discussed in the video. So I'm tremendously excited about this because I've been wanting to put together something like this for quite a while, but I could use your help. So I would like this website to be a community project. Uh, Niels Webb, sort of the de facto manager now of this website having volunteered to create the first version of it. Um, and so um, I, I'll come back to this. I don't wanna, I could probably go on and on about this, but I would encourage you 
to, um, as you're floating around this rainbow code repository, to number one, check the wiki, which has some pages that are like, go through a little bit how this uh, site works. Um, to check the GitHub issues, I could particularly use some input in the realm of interface graphic user experience design. So if you are a designer and would like to contribute to this, that would be wonderful. Um, and yeah, so hopefully um, <laughs> there's some issues here that you can read through, you can help with these. Um, and yeah, so uh, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. See anyone, so that's, that's a, an important announcement. Uh, other things to mention are, if you want um, to join our Slack community, you can support this channel through the Patreon link. Um, and um, like and subscribe and share with your friends. I'm supposed to say that stuff. Okay, so now let's just get started. Ba-boom, ba-bang, 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 bang, boom. Okay, here we go. Ah, what am I doing today? I gotta get myself set up here. I was thinking about switching to using uh, Visual Studio Code, but eh, I'm too used to Atom. Okay. So I've got the neural network thing open. Let me run a server. Oh. Oh, I already have this open. I'm going to close this. How are we doing? How are we doing, everybody? All right. Ah, uh, ah, okay. I uh, guess I need to put my little green paper on this laptop. <laughs> you can now see my very elaborate system. Let's switch briefly to the whiteboard camera, which is all like, no it's not. Um, this is my, my cloaking device. My live streaming cloaking device, piece of paper with very well-worn tape on the back, which I will now bring over to here. Technology, look at this cloaking device. Oh, cloaking device. All right. Um, I am now uh, going to put the cloaking device on the laptop to make the second laptop invisible so you can see the code more easily. I'm going to slide this over. Neural Networks, live on the coding train. Woo! Okay, um, all right, so, <clears throat> let me, uh, uh, <laughs> what, what, what do I need here? All right, so the first thing that I think that I need to do is I want to make some improvements to the matrix library. Let me make a list of those things. Um, all right. I want to, I'm gonna make a mental list, maybe I'll write it down. I want to uh, use static methods. That's item number one. Number two is I want to add a, a randomize function. And number three is I want to add a map function. So these are three things. So I think the first thing I'm gonna do is just do some cleanup on the matrix library. And I, actually before I start, these are three things that were in my head. Um, let me see if uh, anyone um, out there. <laughs> oh, and you know what? I want to add a. Um, 
I want to add a print method. That's another one I don't want to add. Or a tape, maybe I'll call it print table. I don't know what to call it, but print method. So let me see, I'm now, let this, so in other words, what I want to do first is make some improvements to this matrix library. Uh, I want to change the name of this.matrix to this.data. Um, and I want to uh, do, do this list of things to it. Uh, any other suggestions from the chat on, um, on other things I should do to the matrix library before I start? And by the way, thank you. Everyone's compliments about my beard last week. I think I was really planning to go get a haircut this week and do some grooming and I put it off. It's like 60 degrees in New York today though, Fahrenheit that is. And uh, I really feel like it's hot in here. I should have gone to the barber shop yesterday. But you were also kind to me. My mother, if she's watching, I seriously doubt she's watching. So if she watches the first couple minutes, I don't think she's made it this far in. Uh, she would tell me to get a haircut. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Tim says, merge my pull request. Tim, are you the pull request that does the, um, that is the like make the nice HTML table out of the, um, out of the matrix. I do want to merge that one. I was just kind of holding off. I don't know. There's no reason for me to hold it off, hold off actually, because eventually I'm going to replace that library with the one that I'm building live. It's mostly the same, but um, yes. Okay, Tim, thank you for that. I keep, every time I look, you add something and I'm very excited by it. So apologies for not merging it. There's actually no reason for me not to merge it. Let me merge it. Uh, since Tim is watching live. Um, so it, you might be wondering, you can look ahead. There's a lot of mistakes. Um, there is actually this particular GitHub repository, shiftman slash neural dash network dash p5. This is essentially a finished version of what I'm building step by step in these um, videos. Um, and there's a, a wonderful pull request um, that I just learned is by viewer uh, Tim in the live chat who created this uh, amazing function that generates an HTML table and like displays it on the page. So let's just go ahead and merge that in right now, live on air. Nothing like merging a, uh, so let's see if I can make this. <laughs> Confirm merge. <laughs> Woohoo! Thank you, Tim, for the uh, merge pull request. Um, we will maybe I'll try this out later, but the, um, there's there's a bunch of errors in the library, and if I go under issues, a lot of them were. Um, is it all in this thread? There's a long discussion here about many things that are kind of problematic with the version of the library that I'll hopefully be correcting as I go. But I've kind of been holding off because I will come back to this after I keep going. Okay. Um, so uh, Tim created something. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to make a little print method that just does the console.table for me. But um, you can see Tim's method for putting the matrix on screen. Um, oh, another thing that I wanted to show is if you go to, I can't remember who shared this with me, but if you go to, I think, matrix multiplication dot XYZ, there's this wonderful little animation that demonstrates, oh, I should, I gotta zoom out here. That dem let me refresh that. That demonstrates um, how the um, matrix multiplication works with the dot product, uh, and I actually just skipped to the end. So I encourage you to check this out if you want some supplemental visuals for what I did last week. Okay. Um, I'm looking in, So I'm getting some suggestions. Again, replacing names and adding more functions random. Oh, so you people are just saying. All right, so um, as I go, if anybody else sees other improvements to the matrix library that I can do, please let me know. Again, this is not meant to be a comprehensive linear algebra math library for JavaScript. It's meant to be a little bit of like a little toy library right now to learn. Oh, I have a randomize already. I made a randomize already. Okay, that's fine. So I don't need to do that. <laughs> That's funny. Um, uh, this is meant to be a little bit of a toy matrix library to sort of learn all the pieces and kind of get our hands in there to manipulate how the matrix math works. Um, 
and learn a little bit about library development and JavaScript programming. But ultimately, I'm going, once I get further along, this will be replaced by a much more highly optimized and GPU, uh, what does that mean? I'll we'll talk about uh, GPU compatible uh, engine um, called deeplearn.js. All right. Okay, so. Let us begin. All right, welcome. This is now part four of, or no, it's actually, it's actually it. probably like part five. I have no idea what the numbering is. Don't listen to me about the numbering. Just look for the number in the title of the video. But this is another video, or this is the last video that I'm gonna do specifically about, um, Sorry, I saw some stuff in the chat. Let's do it. What are you coding? Uh, oh, okay, okay, sorry. I got distracted. All right. What am I doing again? <laughs> All right. Here we go. Hello, welcome to what I hope will be the last video about matrix stuff. Um, in this series, Building a Neural Network. So um, what I want to do is in this video is just a little bit of cleanup. I'm working on this toy matrix library in JavaScript that does the math operations I'm going to need for the neural network that I'm going to start building in the next video. But before I get to that next video, I want to clean up a few things and make the library a little better. Again, uh, my goal with this is really educational and for my own amusement in many ways, um, I'm not trying to create this highly optimized or efficient, comprehensive matrix math library, just a little simple toy library with some key functions that I'm gonna need. And as we get later, as I get further and further along, I will eventually replace this with something else that somebody has made, which will be much better. Okay, so what is it that I wanna do? I made a little list. Um, I'm checking it just once. <laughs> Uh, it's a list of my favorite things. I'm just trying to reference random songs. Okay, um, this is the list of things that I want to do. And, and a lot of these came from comments from viewers, so thank you for those. Uh, one is I'm going to add something called static methods to the library. And why am I going to do this? Well, some of the functions that I have currently in the library affect the current matrix object that I call the function on. Matrix dot add some number to it. That matrix itself changes when I add a number to all of the elements. But some of the functions in the library actually create a new matrix object and return it. Don't affect the library, the, the object that the function is being called on. And this is where I want to introduce something called static methods, which will make this more clear. So I'll get into that as I introduce it. I just actually noticed there already is a randomized function in there, but um, I, I, I might want to improve that a little bit, although I'll come back to that later. Um, I want to add something called a map function. And what I want to do with the map function is I want to be able to take any arbitrary function and apply it to every element in the matrix. So if I could write a function that doubles a number, and then I could just apply it to the matrix to double every number in the matrix. That's going to be incredibly useful when I get to that neural network stage. I have to say, hey, compute something like the sigmoid or the tan h, the arc tan. There's going to be all sorts of things that I want to do to every element of the matrix. So a generic function called map, like map this function to each number, that's going to be really useful. And then um, I, the other thing that I thought of is I just I do so much console.table, the values, that if I just make a print function that does that for me, that'll make my life easier and nicer. And programming in many ways, hey, it should be more than, it's more than this, but sometimes it's just about making your life a little bit nicer on a daily basis. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start working on these things. There's a live chat going for the people who happen to be watching this live and not the archive edited version. So maybe I'll get some other suggestions along the way. Okay, so let's first, ah, first thing that I want to do, I got this comment several times uh, um, from viewers. This is a particularly, I did a kind of poor job choosing the name for this variable. So this variable right here, this dot matrix, which is part of a matrix, the matrix class, every matrix object has a matrix variable, is kind of problematic because it has the same name as the name of the class, and this can really confuse people. So one thing I want to do is just change this to data. So a matrix object has a certain number of rows and columns, and the two-dimensional array that stores all the values, that's just the data of the matrix object. So I want to change that. And then um, there's a fancy, <laughs> those of you watching probably know, there's a, like a fancy way to do this in Adam. Let's see, how do I do it? 
like, I, I always do this by accident, and I can't do it on purpose, where you click on something and it like changes everywhere else it is. Hmm, sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, sorry, um, I, I'm just looking at the chat. Control D, okay. Uh, I'm <laughs> breaking news from the chat. I'm told that Control D, oh, no, ah, let's try this, hold on. No, it must be Command D for the, yeah, there we go. Ooh, oh, oh, look at that. Oh, this is crazy, but I don't want, uh, never mind. <laughs> Scratch that. I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way, and I'm going to do just a find replace. I'm going to say this dot matrix, replace that with this dot data, because basically everywhere that I'm referring to it, I'm referring to it by uh, this dot matrix. So let's do that replace all, feel confident about that, and hopefully that's okay. All right, so I've done that. Now, let, let's move on. What is the thing that I want to do? I want to, ah, static methods. Okay. So let's look through. This function randomize affects the data of this object. Fine. This function add adds a number or adds another matrix to this particular matrix, changing the values. Done. Transpose, mmm. Ooh. Mmm. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I had such clear vision of what to do. Oh, good. The saved by the stupid camera that goes off. So I'm a little confused what to do here with transpose. I'm going I'm to leave that. I'll come back to it. This is the one. Oh, boy. This is the one where I really, really need to fix up because this is such this is such a disaster the way that I've written this function. <laughs> if if I get a matrix, I create a new object and return that object. If I get a single number, I just multiply every value to th this object's matrix. So this is this is kind of a disaster. I've kind of done two different wildly different things in, in the same function. So what I want to do is add a static function. And a static function, the difference between oh shoot. Let me do a little erasing of the whiteboard for a second. <coughs> Hold on. I guess you can come with me as I erase the whiteboard. Um, we can lose all this stuff. Oh god, this whiteboard needs to be repainted, I think. It's just got so much. So many imperfections. Okay. Uh, might as well erase more since I know I'm going to need to later anyway. So what do I mean exactly by a static method? So uh, methods are functions that are part of a class that are attached to objects made from that class, from that template. And so in the case here, what I'm really doing is I'm saying things like let M be a new matrix. And if I were to say something like M dot multiply, multiply two, this is not a static method. In fact, this is what I guess I think you would refer to as an instance method, maybe. It's a, it's a regular function. It's a function that's called on this particular instance of a matrix object. But what if what I wanted to do is say, what if I had two matrices, M and N, and I wanted to create, or M1 and M2, and I wanted to say M3 
is, and currently the way the library works right now, is I would say m1 dot multiply m2. This is currently the way the library works right now. And it would be fine to keep it this way, but I think what would work better is for me to actually say matrix dot multiply m1 m2. And this is a, and you've seen this before, right? Anytime in JavaScript when you've done something like math dot random or math dot sign. These functions are static functions, part of the math object. Oh god, JavaScript, it really drives me crazy, the naming of all these things. But the point is, it's, a, it's kind of a nice way of namespacing a collection of just utility functions. And so there are some functions in the matrix library that operate on actual instances of matrix objects, and other functions that are just kind of namespaced as part of the matrix world, <laughs> the matrix world, and you could just put things in them and get things out of them. And that's what I think I want to have this multiply function do. So now I need to look up, I actually have to look up the syntax for static methods in JavaScript, because I don't know. I've done this a bunch of times in the Java programming language, but it's probably different in JavaScript. So let me come back over here and let me look up static method uh, JavaScript, and I'm going to type in Mozilla because I like to generally get the Mozilla Foundation documentation. Um, and here we go, static keyword. Ah, so it looks like all I need to do, it's very, very simple, is just put the keyword static in front of the function. So if I now, and the real question is, can I have a stat, the, same, the same function with two names? In other words, am I allowed to have I basically want to have a static version of multiply that receives two matrices, M1 and M2, and a non-static version that receives a single number that, is, um, that, that actually affects the, uh, that matrix itself. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go and find, I'm going to go and take out this all of this math. So this is all of the matrix product math that I worked out in the previous video. And naming-wise, incidentally, I called the two different matrix objects A and B. So in a much simpler way, I can just actually make the argument names A and B. And remember, I'm checking if A's columns are not equal to B's rows. OK, so this should be fine. I'm done. And then here, this multiply function is just the scalar product. There we go. I think I'm good, right? So here's the question. Can I make, let's, let's see if this works. <laughs> Time out. What is going on? The thermometer says 78 degrees in this room. I came in this room this morning and it said 76. I tried to open the window outside of the room. Let me get some fresh air in here. so hot in this room. I don't know why the climate control is not working. You can't see what I'm doing, but I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to will <laughs> some fresh air into this room. All right. Ah! <laughs> I often hit that by accident. Um, What's that in real temperature units? Someone's going to have to do the conversion for me. OK. Um, <clears throat> all right. Let's see if this works. Um, but before I see if it works, let me actually add this print function. Um, this is not going to be, I'm going to put do this on the bottom. I'm going to add a function called print. Um, I could just call it log, maybe. Maybe log is a better. No, no, no. Let's just call it print. And in the print function, I'm going to say console dot table um, this dot data, right? So I want to just console table to this, this dot data. So let's take a look and let's, um, uh, let's, let's try to manipulate some stuff in the console. So let's say, oops, cannot read property matrix.js line 45 of undefined. So I messed something up.
Ah, so I had some other places in the code where I was not saying this dot data, but some other matrix dot, what need now needs to be data. So I, I, I can look for anywhere I'm actually saying dot matrix. And here's some other places. Uh, and some other places. That, that's pretty good. Okay, so I took care of that. Let's go back here. All right. Oh, I forgot that I have a sketch that's running that's trying some things out. But let's, um, let's just say M1 equals a new matrix that is uh, 2 by 2. And I'm going to say M1 uh, uh, randomize. M1.print. Okay, that's the matrix. M1.multiply2. So I want to double all of those values. And then m1.print, again, m1.print. And we can see, okay, so that's working. My old multiply function, the multiply function that takes a single number and affects every element of that matrix is working. Now, let's see if the static one works. So now I'm going to say uh, let m, m2 be a new matrix. And I'm going to say m2.randomize and m2.print just to check it out. Whoops. Hmm, why did that not work? Oh, I didn't give it. So I probably, so I forgot to give it uh, a number of rows and columns. I should probably add some error handling into the library that says like, hey, you forgot to give me the columns and rows or use a sub default value. Let's, let's try that again. m2 equals a new matrix. That's also two by two. Let's print it out, and oh, let's uh, randomize it, and let's print it out, and there we go. Okay, so now, let m3 equal matrix dot multiply m1, m2. This is now how I want to get a new matrix, which is the result of the dot product, the matrix product, between matrix 1 and matrix 2. And if I say m3 dot print, Okay, so I can only assume that the math works correctly. <laughs> uh, somebody watching this should feel free to pause and check that math and write in the comments if it's wrong. But um, what I was really looking for, I checked the math, that the math worked correctly last week. So I'm really looking for now, um, am, I, am, do, am I allowed to have two methods, one that's static with a given name and one that's not static with a given name. And it looks like I am. And it makes sense that it would be able to do that because they're called in completely different ways. There's no reason why the computer should ever get confused between the instance, the computer, the JavaScript interpreter should ever get confused between the instance version and the static version. All right, everyone. Uh, pause for a second. Uh, all right, let's see. I'm looking. All right, so what am I going to do next here? Map. Oh, I'm going to do the map function. Okay. All right. So um, as an exercise to the viewer, what I would say for you, if you're watching this and you're following along, take this transpose function and make a static version that does what this is doing, returns a new matrix object. Um, and, uh, and, make, um, and make and keep this version, but make it actually internally change the matrix itself and transpose it so it's reusing the same variable. Um, I don't know if that's totally necessary, but the, uh, uh, maybe I'll, uh, I'll do that on my own, adjust it. I don't know what, I, <laughs> it's, the, it's the heat. <laughs> it's the heat in this room. <laughs> it's making me crazy. All right, um, let, me, let me just, um, for poor Mathieu editing, let me just uh, say that again. Uh, could you make a sign on the screen telling people what you are doing? Hmm, that's an interesting idea. The issue is I would want that to only go out on the live stream and not on the um, recorded versions. And right now I don't have a, then I don't have a, I don't, right now I don't have a way of separating that. So, um, but this is a good, what I used to do is like just write in the video's description what I was doing that day. And then I became lazy and stopped doing that. But I will take that under con con consideration. Um, All right. As an exercise to the viewer, you know, we, we can make some arguments whether what's, what's the sort of optimal or most 
elegant way to write this library, but for as an exercise for the viewer, what you could do is take this transpose function and make a static version of it, which is essentially this right, which I, I was about to do it, make a static version of this and perhaps leave an instance version which changes the internal data of the matrix object itself to be the transposed matrix. But I'm gonna leave that as an exercise for the viewer. So the last thing that I need to do in this particular video is create a map function. That's going to be a function that takes any generic function as an argument, whoa! Uh, so if, you, if this is, I think, I think this might be the first time I've really done this in a video uh, in JavaScript. Let's think about this for a second. I can write a function. Let's, let's think about how I'm gonna write this. Um, can I use this eraser? It looks like I can. All right, so I am going to create a function. We gotta, we gotta think about this for a second. So if I were writing a function, and I did this already, called something like add, and it receives a number, right? This is a function I have in my matrix object where what I'm gonna do is say plus equal, uh, you know, I'm gonna have a whole bunch of for loops for every element of the matrix, add this number to it, right? That's what this function does. What I'm saying I wanna do is create a function called map. And what that function does is it receives a variable. Maybe I'll call it fn right now for function. Maybe callback is, it's not really a callback. So it's not a callback. <laughs> fn for function. And what it's going to do is it's going to execute this function somewhere in the code. And this is something that you can't really easily do in a programming language like Java. Um, you can't make a function, a variable that you pass around easily without some like real crazy gymnastics. But this is very native to how JavaScript works. Arguments, we think of them, parameters to a function, we think of them as, oh, send these numbers in or send these, um, yeah, send these other objects in. But a function is a thing that I can send in just as well. So let's look at how this would work. In other words, instead of adding a number to every element of the matrix, I want to apply a function to every element of the matrix. And let's look at how we do that. Um, okay, so um, let's, I think the add function, actually we can look here at, the, um, this is kind of a useful, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this multiply function that instead of add, it just multiplies this number to el every element here as a starting point. So I'm gonna call this function map as a kind of generic term for mapping a function. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to say, so I want this same exact, uh, uh, apply a function to every element of matrix. And I'm gonna say right now, I'm just gonna create a variable, let value equal this dot data ij. In other words, I wanna say, I wanna look through every element of the matrix and I wanna take that value. Now this would be me just assigning that element of the matrix its value. What's its value? Assign it. This, is, this would not change the matrix at all. But in two steps, I pull the value out and I put it back in. But if I have this function, what, why don't I just apply that function to the value and put it in? So I can execute that function with the value and then assign the result of that function to the data. Make sense? So this might make even more sense once we see how it's used. And you know, th this is only gonna work if I send in functions that are written in a certain way, but we'll look at that. And maybe somebody watching can let me know, what's a, is there a conventional name for what you might call a generic function that's being passed in? You know, I, I, don't, wanna, I don't wanna call it function because that's a reserved keyword. I could call it funk. Map this funk. <laughs> funk. <laughs> that's good, I like that. Funk. Let's change it to funk, okay. All right, so now let's, let's uh, in order to see if I've done this correctly, let me go to sketch.js, which is sort of just a bit of like code that I can use to sort of mess around and see if things are working. Um, oh, 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 Lambda, okay, oh, okay. Time out, time out, time out, hold on. I'm getting some good, uh, wouldn't data, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading some comments that I'm getting in the Slack group here. Wouldn't data ij dot slice array prototype slice be better for cloning an array of numbers? Probably. Where am I doing that? Um, you should pass i and j to the lambda function. Need that i and j. 
So I, I know this is, I, I see what you're saying here. Um, oh yeah, you mean like this? Yes, this is a good point. Okay. All right, I, I'm going to, um, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll come back and mention that, okay? So, because that, that can be useful, you're right. But I'm, I'm not going to worry about that right now. Okay. Okay, so let me keep, um, and in fact, this will actually negate the need for certain functions like randomize potentially or add, because I could always create those functions and then call them through the map. But let's look at this. So let's say I have a matrix, and I'm going to say a dot randomize, and then I'm going to say a dot print. So what I want to see is just, and I'll keep this just as a two by two matrix, easier to see. So I'm going to refresh this page and we can say here's my random two by two matrix. Now what I want to do is I'm going to write a function called double it. And it takes some arbitrary value, let's call it x, and it returns x times two. So this is a function, a generic function that receives a value and returns the doubled version of it. So if I say an a dot map, double it, what this should do is it should send this function double it in through the function map. It's going to receive it here, run through, and now it's saying this dot data ij equals double it val. So it's calling the double it function for every value in the matrix. So let's go back to here and if I say a dot print now, and I run this, we should see, look at this, here's a matrix with values 2773 or 27, actually, whoa, <laughs> and, and now I have 4, 14, 14, 6, all the values are doubled. Great. That works. <laughs> I just have to give myself a little, I, I need a little reassurance every once in a while in the form of bad, lame sound effects. Okay, um, <clears throat> so, ah, so, so I'm being told in the chat that, and this, by the way, is often referred to as a lambda function, maybe, but um, sometimes it is uh, useful to, to actually use the index values. So there are, uh, there are, so there might be a reason why you want to optionally also pass in the ij, the row column location of of each, um, uh, when you're calling the, the function that's being passed in, because you might want to, you might want to operate on it depending on where it is in the matrix. Like maybe if it's an edge value, you do something different. So in that case, um, this can be useful. So this is a little bit of an additional advanced thing. I'm going to leave it out of my very simple library, but I thought I should mention that. Um, and and it, it's up to you to then, therefore, um, so I could do something like, as long as i is greater than 0, return x times 2, otherwise uh, return just x. So I could start to do sort of an advanced thing like, ah, I don't want to just do this to everything, but not the, do something different to the first row kind of thing. All right. Let me put this back. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. Da -da 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 -da. term for functions like map and functional programming is higher order. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you, Vladi, for that. Um, <clears throat> okay. All right. So um, this brings me to the end of this particular video. I am sure there are things, I mean, I'm really sure there are things this matrix class is missing that any comprehensive matrix class would need. And I wouldn't be surprised even if we discover some things we have to change and alter to this as I start building the neural network. But in the next video, what I want to do is return back to this topic of a perceptron. What happens when I have multiple perceptrons, a multi-layered perceptron, and why all of a sudden does this concept of a matrix become so meaningful and important for the math of feed forward? A neural network is actually often referred to as a universal function, approximator, right? It receives input, it generates an output. 
Why do I need matrices inside of that neural network to manipulate how I get the output from the input? That's what I want to look at the next video, the feed forward algorithm. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, oh, Alka is saying in transpose, I have a nested loop, but I only need one loop and a slice. Yes, <laughs> that is correct. So the other thing I should mention is that, um, right, I could use slice here. There are uh, lots of array functions like reduce, uh, fill, map, and, um, you know, in fact, there's already the, um, so I'm just not using those right now. Uh, I, was, I was thinking about revising this library to use all of those array functions, but then someone told me they're like very slow. <laughs> so I'd only be using them just to like make things look shorter in terms of the code, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick to what I have. All right. So I'm definitely going to need to, um, uh, and I'm gonna open this door to try to get some fresh air into this room while I erase the whiteboard. Danger here is that there's people walking by in the hallway who have no idea that I'm live streaming and <laughs> want to say hello. But I'm going to live dangerously in order to get some hopefully cooler, fresh air into this room. So I think probably what makes sense is for me to divide this particular feed forward algorithm into two videos. One where I just walk through and diagram how it's going to work and another, I and J are bad variable names. Yes, they are. <laughs> um, ah, I should be reading the chat. Um, uh, diagram out the feed forward algorithm and explain how it works uh, and then uh, implement the code for it. Uh, and then I will do a third video where I add the bias. Although maybe I need to talk about the bias right from the start. So I have to figure, I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to do this. This is like hard. <laughs> Uh, let's see over here. Okay. Let's see if I can get a little more fresh air. That's going to have to do. A race over here. What's the time, everybody? 11.30. So I, this has been about an hour. I was hoping to be done at 1. Let's see how that goes. Okay, just <laughs> those of you in the Slack channel who are discussing the optimal way to rewrite some of the matrix library functions, just to be clear, you're just discussing that amongst yourself, right? I haven't done anything horribly wrong. I need like, we need like a secret emoji that you can include. Maybe use a train emoji if it's something really important for me or something like that. All right. All right, you, know, you have not missed the challenge, okay. Oh, right. Yes, yes, yes. So many people. Okay, so many good comments. Um, all right. Wait, actually, before I start this, let me go back. And what I want to see here is I want to look at, and let me open the door a little bit longer while I'm doing this. Um, what I want to do is look at my playlist. And um, uh, this one, I think. Hello, welcome. Um, okay, so 
really what I'm doing here is returning back to 10.5. So I'm going to return to 10.5 and talk about the structure and look at how suddenly the matrix math is relevant to that. And one, two, yes, yeah, six, three, four, I did one more five, so that was part five. Yeah, okay. Um, all right. <laughs> okay. Close this other stuff. And okay. All right. Okay. All right, I'm back to talk about neural networks again. Now, ah, two things I want to mention. I'll be right back, I swear. Is again, I need to, uh, all the information that I'm showing you has come primarily from two sources. I mean, I've definitely looked at other sources as well. Um, this book, Make Your Own Neural Network, uh, by Tariq Rashid. I'll include a link to the Coding Train Amazon shop if you want to get your own uh, copy of this, as well as Three Blue One Brown's videos. So Three Blue One Brown has a series, uh, is a YouTube channel that has a series of videos about neural networks and deep learning, and I would encourage you to uh, watch those as well along, along with mine. So I'm going to try to explain the stuff as I go, but really my focus is on implementing the stuff in JavaScript. Whereas if you watch the three blue, one brown videos, those really are, the focus is on how does it work and gaining an intuition for understanding the math behind how the neural network works. And the animations and diagrams will be much better than anything I very poorly illustrate for you on this whiteboard. But I'm going to go ahead anyway. Thanks for being here with me. Uh, but go and watch those videos. Okay. So so a neural network is something that you can think of as a function. It receives inputs and generates outputs. And if you remember, we started this playlist, I started with this idea of a simple perceptron being a single neuron. And that neuron could receive two inputs. We might have called those x0, x1, and generate one output calling that y. Um, what I, now, w and, and so we use this to like train this perceptron. If x0 and x1 is actually a point in a two-dimensional plane, we can train this perceptron to return a positive one if it's above a line or a negative one if it's below a line. So these are really toy problems just to kind of get a sense to produce a very like obvious result to see that it works. So let's go forward with another toy problem that I referred to in my perceptron video. What if these were just inputs were binary uh, Boolean values? So true or false? In other words, one or zero. And this one, I'm like, hold on a sec. Let me turn this a little bit. And this one is also true or false, one or zero. This would work if I wanted this to, to solve for and, basically. I want the output to be a one or true only if both of the inputs are true. And in all other cases, it should be a false, a zero. If I, if I wanted this perceptron to solve or, or, or I would get a value, an output of one if just one of these were true. And we could probably even like manually assign the weights to figure out to make this work. But as I referenced in my previous video, there is another kind of Boolean operation called exclusive or, which means uh, true and true gives me false, true and false gives me true, false and true gives me true, and false and false gives me false. So this is exclusive or, meaning it's only true if one is true. If they're both true, it's false. And this single perceptron can actually not solve this. This is where we need a multi-layered perceptron, meaning we need a second perceptron. We need to send both inputs into that as well. And, 
and then both of these need to be sent into the output known as Y. So I'm actually going to rewrite this. I'm now going to draw this like this. This is actually now a neural network because we can think of the inputs as nodes, these two perceptrons that I've inserted in here as nodes, and this output as a node. And this is, I better write it down here, a three-layer network. Input, the input layer, can you see that? The, this is referred to as the hidden layer, I'll talk about that in a second. The hidden layer and the output. Now, <clears throat> I am missing from this diagram something called the bias. I will return to the bias later. We saw that we needed a bias to like sort of like move this line that we we're trying to learn where it is up and down. So I will come back to the bias, but I'm going to leave that out for right now. So we have this input layer, a hidden layer output. Now, why is this called the hidden layer? Well, it's kind of like hidden because me, the person who's operating this neural network, I am in charge of the input. I will give it the input. And now me, the person in charge of this neural network, will read the output and use it presumably in my program. So the user of the network is, is kind of sending in the input and examining the output. So hidden is hidden because it's actually a part of the network that the user, the end user, doesn't manipulate at all. And as you'll see later on, there can be multiple hidden layers. These kinds of architectures can get quite sophisticated and complex. And I'm going to go through, hopefully eventually in all these videos, many much more elaborate neural network architectures that involve you know, inputs in different ways and multiple hidden layers and attach to this other thing and blah, 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 blah. Outputs can come back and feed back into the input. There's all sorts of crazy stuff you can do. But this is a very basic, basic starting point, a three-layer network. One input layer, one hidden layer, one output layer. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second to see if there's any questions. Um, uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to um, uh, turn this camera back on. <coughs> okay, I'm going to have a little drink of water here. How's how's this? Work it out so far. Did I miss anything? Okay. Okay. All right. All right, so a couple things. One is, you know, the goal of this is to use more interesting inputs. And the hello world of machine learning that you'll see in every example and demo, it's in the three blue, one brown videos, is uh, a, a handwritten digit recognizer. So in other words, these inputs could be all the values of pixels of a given image. And you could also be used, you could use a system like this to try to predict the price of a house. So the inputs could be the number of bedrooms or the, um, the zip code, I mean, kind of getting convoluted here. But so data, how you collect and prepare and use data is a big, important, fundamental topic. I can't really, I'm not, right now I'm using the simplest possible scenario where I don't have to worry about it. My input data is just zeros and ones, true or false. But don't, don't miss out on this question. Thinking about uh, how you collect data, what could be missing from the data, this is a really big, important question. I hope to come back to that in future videos as well. Okay. But in this case, I want to just use this very simple idea. Now, how does the feed forward algorithm work? So let's say we receive an input, and the input is a 1 and a, a 0. Or, or one, oh. All right, let me, let me just start over my little train of thought there for a second. <laughs> let's take uh, an input. So let's say I have an input, and again, I'm going to have to get to the bias later, but let's say the input's coming in, the input coming in, ah, okay, ah, so first of all, I know what, I know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I need to represent the input in some way. So the typical way that we would represent the input is in vector notation looking like this, x0, x1. So let's say I take an input of 1 and 1. What I need to do, right, remember these connections all have a weight. 
This is, uh, if we think of this as hidden zero, this is, this is x0, x1, maybe this is kind of like hidden zero, this is hidden one. And again, the hidden layer can have a different number of neurons uh, than, the, than the input layer, but we're, we're doing a simple scenario here. This connection is a connection between zero and zero. This connection is a connection between zero and one. It's a weight between zero and one. This is a connection between weight one and zero, sorry. And this is a connection between weight, uh, between, uh, this is a connection, a weight between input one and hidden neuron one. Now look at all these. Now, what happens in a perceptron, in a single neuron? A single neuron receives the weighted sum of all the inputs, meaning this particular neuron should receive, and I'll write it down here, x0 times weight 0, 1 plus x1, x1 times weight uh, 1, 0. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is 0, 0. Apologies, my handwriting is very poor. <laughs> this is weight input 0 to hidden 0. So this is weight 0, 0. This makes sense, right? The weighted sum is both inputs multiplied by their weights, corresponding weights added together. It's this. Now, I also have to add something called the bias in here. Come back to that. So this is what I get. This one down here is x1 times the weight of from 1 to 0 plus x2 times the weight of 1 to 1 right? 1 to 0, 1 to 1. Ah, no, 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 no. I keep getting this stuff wrong. <laughs> 0, 1, right? This is the sum of x0, ah, x0, I should have had more coffee this morning, x0, x1, x0 times weight 0 between 0 and 1 plus x1 times the weight from 1 to 1 plus a bias. We'll call this bias zero and bias one. I'll come again, so eh, come back to the bias. <laughs> this, now look at this, interesting. This is so fascinating. Doesn't this all look familiar? So I could go, I could, I could stop here and say, hey, guess what I'm gonna do now? I'm gonna write the code because I can use for loops. Right? If I have like these neuron objects and I keep an array of them, then I have like the weights, then I could do a for loop that could just sort of like loop through everything and sum everything up. But, 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 but guess what? It so happens that this exact operation resembles something that I've been spending four or five videos about. This is actually the formula, and let's we'll take out, the, I, that's why I wanted to remove the bias for a second, we'll come back to it, for, what if I think about these weights as living in a matrix, right? There's actually, the, if I have, the, if I have an, uh, an input layer and a hidden layer, and I need a weight that connects every input neuron to every hidden neuron, then I have a matrix whose dimensions are pause, let me think about this. Yeah, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna, uh, <laughs> hi Grace, watching, six-year-old Grace. Hi Grace, I appreciate you watching. I have a six-year-old as well. She does not watch my YouTube channel. <laughs> well, she's in school right now. <laughs> uh, okay, I doubt, I seriously doubt her first grade classroom is watching my YouTube channel. Um, <clears throat> so I know this is gonna be two by two. I'm just thinking about this for a second. So this is gonna be zero, zero, one, zero. Yeah, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 okay. But if this were, if, if there were three here, this would be three by two. So it's the number of inputs by the number of hidden. I think that's right. Is that right? Can someone confer, fact check for this for me? If there were three inputs here, there would, this would be three by two, right? Because you have three things all connected to there. Yeah, okay.
<laughs> Simon is telling me that I made a video explaining all this already. <laughs> it's quite possible. It doesn't hurt to do it more than once. Two by three, yes, yes, yes. Two by three, I meant two by three, because two rows, three columns. I just said three by two, <laughs> but I was like mentally I had it right. Two by one, two, three, because I need to send three across to do the dot product with these two. I have to have the same number of rows no, the same number of columns as I have rows. Don't have to, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. It, this would be two by, this would be three by two. One, two, three by two. One, one, da, da, da. These would be the connections. Connections from here to there, connections from here to there. Connect, okay, okay, I got it. <laughs> I had to think about this a few times. Okay, okay. Number of columns equals inputs. Number of rows is hidden news. If you think about this, this relates exactly to something I've been spending many, many, many videos about. If I take um, these weights and put them into a matrix, okay, so the number of columns should equal how many input nodes I have, right? And then the number of rows would have to be the number of hidden, right? Remember, so look at this. This would be, I could store the weights between zero and zero, the weights between 1 and 0, the weights between 1 and 0, and the weights between 1 and 1. Now, I should have probably not used a square matrix, so it's making our life a lot easier, but if I happen to have another hidden, another input, if there were three inputs, I would just have another row. I would have weights from 2 to 0, weights from 2 to 1. But look at this. If I take the dot product of this vector with this vector, Look what I get. This. x0 times weight 0, 0 plus x1 times weight 1, 0. If I take the dot product of this vector with this vector, that is, oops, sorry, this. It's the matrix product. The matrix product of the inputs with the matrix of weights gives you a resulting vector, okay, hold on, and right, this vector is going to be a two by one vector, same as this, and it's going to have this in the first spot and this in the second spot, and that is, those are the values that, of the hidden neurons. Now, that's the value of the weighted sum of the hidden neurons. If you remember from my perceptron video, we have to pass those weighted sums through something called an activation function. I will get to that in a second. I'm trying to um, get to that. Side. So what I want to do now is write this up a little bit better. Boy, this is like hard. Okay, let me erase this over here. I need some more whiteboard space. Okay, so let me rewrite this up here. Let me, let me, wait, hold on. Where, I have a lot of space. Yeah, I have a lot of space. This goes all the way to here. I'm gonna rewrite this up here. So I'm going to say the, for any given, Let me think about this. All right. <laughs> Let me rewrite this up here. So what I have, just to review, is I have a matrix of weights. 
weight zero zero, weight one zero, weight uh, zero one, weight one one. Then I have the inputs x zero, uh, x one. And this would be a good time to add in the bias. So why do I need a bias? So if you recall from the perceptron example, we needed the bias as a way of saying like, eh, you know, it's sort of you have this problem. If you're sending in zeros, the weighted sum of a whole bunch of things multiplied by zeros is always going to be zero. But sometimes that actually should be a neuron that act, a neuron that activates. And so the bias is something that can help move. Say, ah, it doesn't. It's not as hard to act. We could have a high bias, meaning it's not so hard to activate this neuron. We're going to add some arbitrary number to it to like move the value up a little bit. Or we could have a negative bias saying like, oh, we've got to really make this hard. So this is a way of giving us more ability to sort of like have the neurons behave accurately. And the biases is actually just another number that we add to that weighted sum. So we can actually look at it like this. This is and so another way of looking at this is to say the hidden layer equals the weight matrix, I'll say that's capital A, the with the matrix products of the inputs plus the bias. I'm, I'm, I'm like thinking about my notation very carefully here because I need to pass this through um, an activation function. But the activation function happens for each one, yeah. So, okay. So the weights are kind of like weights between i and j. The inputs are for, from 0 to j, zero, or j, and the biases are like j. We can think of it that way. Thinking about this. Mm -hmm. Where's the woo part of the whiteboard? Oh yeah, W-O-O. -O. <laughs> Still the wrong order on the indices. Where do I have the wrong order on the indices? Write the W's before the X's and the indices are more logical. Oh, okay, hold on. Oh yeah. Ah, crap. It's just this one that's wrong, right? Oh yeah, oh my god, look at this. Ah! Oh boy. All right, uh, guess what? You've been watching this video for quite a while and I have a big, big major mistake here. And uh, let me fix this. <laughs> I rewrote it up here. So this, by the way, is 0, 0, 1, 0, and this is 0, 1, 1, 1. But don't I write the, oh, okay, hold on. It, I kind of supposed to do row, column, so this should be 0, 0, 0, 1, row 1, column 0, row one column. This is now right. Is this correct? This would be the standard way of writing this. Is this correct? Yep. Now I have to fix the diagram up here. Okay. All right, slightly awkward edit point there, but I've unfortunately had a major mistake. I, I appreciate that some of you are probably watching this video, screaming at it, um, that I have this mistake. But, um, so the convention for writing, first I had the numbers wrong anyway, but the convention for writing the, the um, index values in a matrix is row column, row column. A three by two matrix is three rows, two columns. So these numbers here should be row, column, row, column. Row zero, column zero. Row zero, column one. This is row zero, this is column zero, this is column one. Now I'm in row one, column zero, row one, column one. So that 
affects these, right? 0, 0 times x0, uh, 0, 1 times x0. Then I have uh, x0 times 1, 0. Uh, and x1 times 1, 1, which is correct. <laughs> and I like to also refer to weight 0, 0 as woo! <laughs> so now let me correct this. Woo! Still in row 1, column 1. Now I'm in row 1, column 0, and row 1, column 1. And by the way, I, I have seen, um, right, because you can think of it, row, 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 row. That makes sense. Um, because if these were, if this is a matrix that just has one column, this is really this. But I, I, don't, I, I don't need those there. I'm going to sort of assume that. Um, um, you, you will see a lot of people conventionally not starting with zero, but say x1, x2, but you know, it's the same thing. I guess I'm just, I'm so used to counting from zero, that's how I have to do it. All right, I'm going to pause for a second to fact check that. Um, all right, now, can somebody fact check me that I now finally do have that correct? Yeah, Tim is saying the network has two layers, not three, but I, you know, it's, <laughs> the input and outputs are, you know, this is, the input is a special case. The input layer is just sort of like the input numbers. So you're right, but I, if I'm going to consider it three layers. It's sort of the convention that I kind of understand. And the input layer does, the activation stuff only happens with these two layers, not the first layer. Okay. Um, this video is not editable. You, sh you should be surprised what Mathieu can do. All right. Uh, diagram still wrong, but matrix seems fine. What's wrong in the diagram? Oh, 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 the diagram is wrong. All right, so now that I ba went backwards and fixed up these, now I'm realizing that these are, of course, wrong, right? Because the connections, no, wait, wait, wait. I think the diagram is correct. Because these are the connections for for the first row, and these are the connections for the second row. So what's wrong with the diagram? Uh, me, I am so me tells me the diagram is wrong. Um, but I, it looks right to me. The row is the target perceptron. W-O-I and W-I-O are wrong way around. How come I don't see this? This is the, uh, this is the weight from zero to zero. Oh, 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 oh. You're saying, yeah, 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 yes, 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 I see. Okay, okay. I get it, I get it, I see it now. Ugh. This could be a case, you know, sometimes Mathieu does say to me, just go back and do it again. And I, I wouldn't be opposed to coming back like later um, today or like someday next week and just redoing this if this doesn't work. Because a lot of times I have to do these explanations to work them out and understand them. But I, I see the mistake now. Because... These are the two things that are getting summed. X1 times 0, 1. Okay. Okay, good thing I stopped to fact check this. Thank you again to the live chat. I have the diagram wrong now because this, even though this looks kind of right, weight between 0 and 0, weight between 0 and 1, I have the order of these incorrect because this neuron is being multi. This, this, this weighted sum is x0 times 0, 0, x1 times 
0, 1. So I need to put the row first, the column second. So this is correct. These were the only two ones that were incorrect. So now the diagram is correct. This is correct. And this is correct. Row being I, column being J. So we're ready now. Once I've got this, once I've got this, so the hidden, this is what I'm, this is basically what I'm saying. Hidden for every hidden node, the weighted sum is the uh, weight, the, the weight matrix product with the input plus all the biases. But this is not enough. I need to figure out what do I actually send out through, um, out of the hidden layer. So what is the output? It, we, the, the math is it needs to pass through some activation function. So we saw in my previous perceptron example that I had a very simple activation function. It was the sine function. And the sine function just says, if it's greater than zero, send out a one. If it's less than zero, send out a negative one. And if it's zero, I don't know, send out a one or a negative one. Pick one of those arbitrarily. Not random, but be consistent. So um, it turns out that what you pick as the activation function for a neural network can really affect how the neural network behaves and how well it solves a particular kind of problem. And there, this is a, a field of active research. And there, uh, I'm going to use the sort of a function called the sigmoid function, which I will represent with the Greek letter sigma. Um, this, is, this is kind of the original activation function that was developed as neural network research began in the 80s, 90s. Um, however, we will see today that there are, so sigmoid is one possible activation function. Tan h, or inverse tangent. Oh, you can't see that. Sorry, hold on. Uh, Sigmoid is one possible activation function. I know that's very high up there on the whiteboard. Uh, tan h is another activation function. And there is something also called relu, or I like to say the French relu. Uh, that stands for rectified linear unit. The point of the activation function is what we want are values coming out of the neural network that have a very consistent range. And we want to squish, like the, these weighted sums can be any value, that could be, that could be like negative five bazillion, right? But I want to be able to take a function to kind of squash those values into some particular range. Tan h does a nice job of squashing the values between negative one and one. Sigmoid is a function that does a nice job of squashing the values between uh, zero and one. And Relu <laughs> doesn't actually squash the values. And I'll come back to it later when we get to some other, but it just takes away the negative value. But this is, act, this is, this is active research. But I'm going to use the sigmoid function. <laughs> I'm going to use the sigmoid function. Let's take a look at the sigmoid function. Sigmoid function. Uh, sigmoid function is a mathematical function having an S-shaped curve, and it looks something like this. And I guess I was wrong. I don't know why I said between 0 and 1. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It is between 0 and 1. Um, so hold on. Or lo logistic function. Hold on. Let me come back. <laughs> so let's take a look. This is the Wikipedia page for the sigmoid function. Actually, it's not the Wikipedia page. That's the Wikipedia diagram. But I can go to the Wikipedia page, and we can see here this is also referred to as the logistic function. It uses that magic number e, and it takes whatever the value is um, and um, does this to it. And, and all, no matter what number you pass into the sigmoid function, you get a number back between 0 and 1. High values approach closer to 1. Negative values approach closer to 0. So we, unlike a sort of biological neural network where a neuron is either going to choose to fire or not, we're firing these continuous activation functions that fire somewhere in the range, but they give a number output somewhere in the range between 0 and 1. Um, so again, this sigmoid function is not used that much anymore in kind of current neural network research. And as I get further, we'll look at other uh, activation functions as well. But it's sort of the classic one. And it's the one used both in the Make Your Own Neural Network book and the three blue, one brown videos. 
Um, okay. So I'm thinking, what is the, what is E, E is the, um, why am I blanking on, um, why am I blanking on the, um, is, e, is E the natural number, and is there a constant in JavaScript? Right, um, you, uh, Euler's number? No. Uh, Euler's constant, it's pronounced Euler, right? And it is the natural, I, I call it the natural, math.e, okay, thank you. Um, all right, that's what I wanted to check, okay. It's the base for the natural logarithm, right? Okay. 2.7-ish, uh, yeah, close enough, 2.7-ish. All right. Um, All right, if, uh, if you've made it to the end of this video, you deserve a special prize. <laughs> I don't know what that prize should be. <laughs> no, I don't know, I was gonna like give you a hair for my beard. That's a, that's a very weird and creepy prize. Just, let's edit that out. Um, except not, uh, now that I actually do edit these videos, maybe that will be edited out. I don't, uh, so confusing here. So somebody will also make this decision, the neural network. But um, if you've made it to the end of this video and this has helped you, please let me know in the comments. I'm sure this will spark a lot of confusion and questions, and I can always come back and revisit this topic, but I think I'm now at the point where I can actually take this feed forward algorithm. And by the way, the output, what I'm not mentioning here is this output layer is going to do the exact same thing. It's going to take the weighted sum of all of its inputs, pass it through the active, plus a bias, pass it through the activation function, and um, and then give an output. So you, you could quibble with this idea of being a three-layer na network, three-layer network, because this first layer, the input layer, is kind of a special case. It doesn't do anything. It's just the input numbers. But I'm going to call it a layer, the input layer. The hidden layer performs this math, and the output layer, right? We could write the same thing. Whoops, is sigma of all of the weights between the hidden and the output times the hidden's output plus some biases. So, um, and again, this, this, this weight matrix refers to these weights, this weight matrix refers to uh, these weights, and, and, and the same thing for the biases. So this is the idea. Can I now take this mathematical formula that I somewhat understand and implement it in code and use the matrix library that I've developed? This is what, and then, if so, can we actually solve, train a neural network, we have to do the whole training thing, to produce the correct output for the XOR problem? Again, this is just to sort of learn and figure out the lingo the, on, and how all this stuff works so that later when I go to use some higher level libraries that do all this implementation for me, because I really don't want to write all the code for this. I mean, I, 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 I sort of do, but you don't. Or maybe you do. Anyway, I just want to get a sort of foundation and knowledge. So now let's go to that next step. C come with me if you so choose. <laughs> Creepy music underneath me, da 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 da. Um, all right, oops. All right, where am I time-wise? <laughs> and, and I thought it was gonna be like way ahead of schedule. Um, yes, thank you for everybody donating through the super chat. I really do appreciate that. I actually don't have a good system to like see those. Um, so I, I'm sorry I missed them, <laughs> but I will go look at them afterwards. Uh, but uh, I would say if you do want to support the channel, uh, Patreon is an excellent way to do so um, as well. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, the heat is having an effect. Um, certainly is. It still says, it sort of still says 78. All right. Um, let me have a drink of water here. And anyone have any corrections they want to offer? Uh, 
Oh, math.expx is e to the x. Thank you, that's good to know. I'll be using that. B's and H's indices must be i, not j. Let me take a look at that. Good thing i and j look kind of similar. Um, so, oh, they're i. Yes, you're right. <laughs> I know I just left, but in the corrections department, I'm really having trouble being consistent and doing a good job of my kind of row columns indices. I kind of had to do this to like get used to it. I probably should just go back and redo this whole video. But um, these should really be i. Good thing i and j look very similar. You could almost say that I got it correct. Um, but it's because it's the, um, there is only one column. There are many rows. So the column is assumed to be like zero, but we're looking at all the different rows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that should be um, I zero. That should be an I. Thanks. <laughs> um, all right, let's see if I, let's see um, if there are any other corrections. All right. H and O, I believe, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I also missed over here. I. I. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Mathieu. Oi, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> So this, this, we could also do a Mathieu when you watch this later. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I'm not opposed to um, using some um, uh, um, overlay in the video to like point out where the errors are during the video if you think that's gonna be helpful. Okay, K okay, Weekman is leaving. <laughs> no, don't go. <laughs> I love your index nagging. Index nagging is like, that should be the new song. I'm nagging you about your indices. Get them right. It's rows by columns, not columns by rows. But sometimes it's x by y, but sometimes the x is first, or it's the i, it's the j. I don't know. This is the number from my musical, Machine Learning, the musical. It's the opening number. Indices, indices. Everybody's got lots of indices. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> Yes, so B, I am so me. So I do think also the convention is to start with one. I just can't bring myself to do that because I'm so used to array indices as starting from zero. But I do think you're right. I think uh, in a mathematical textbook, you would see these as one, 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 two, two, one, two, two. When I make this video over, because Mathieu tells me it was a total disaster and I should not be releasing this content whatsoever under any circumstances, I will maybe start from one. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So look how many people are watching. I don't know how many people are watching. I can't look. I don't have an, I do have a place I can look actually. Um, oh, 634, that is nuts. Um, okay. Um, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, I, okay. Uh, I want to be able to do this coding challenge and I want to try to get out here, out of here like a little after one. So let's do that. And, and I also want to get some fresh air in this room. Let's try it just for a minute. I'm going to open this up. So the next point that I need to do and is to write the code for this stuff. So let's do that. There can be more neurons than inputs, right? Yes. All right. Okay. 
Let's try to get some fresh air, a little more fresh air. For the coding challenge, I might have to just wear my t-shirt. <laughs> yes, Simon, I did see your comment about activation functions. Thank you for that. Um, so I will, as I get further, we'll come back. But I'm going to use sigmoid just for this demonstration. Okay. Hmm, ah. I realize what I need now, but it's okay. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll add that into the matrix library during this video. Okay, now we're at the moment. <laughs> I spent a lot of time <laughs> looking like a crazy person <laughs> trying to write out and understand the feed-forward algorithm for a neural network, a simple three-layer network with an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. I try to work out the math and understand it, understand it as the output of the hidden layer is the matrix product of the inputs times the weights plus the biases passed through an activation function. That is sent out into the output, which does exactly the same thing with the output of the hidden times the weights plus the biases passed through an activation function. And then we get our answer. Is it true or is it false? What's the number? Now I'm going to try to take this algorithm and apply it in code, and luckily for me, I have already written all the code to do the matrix product. So I just need to create matrices that have weights, I need to generate an input, I need to run through this math and look at the output. I'm not going to get a useful output in this video. I'm going to get essentially a random output. I do need to do the next part, which is not going to be easy, which is training the neural network, adjusting all and tuning all the weights and biases so that the neural network learns what are the optimal weights and biases to output the correct, the, well, correct is kind of a weird word to use here, but this sort of desired output based on some training data. So I've got to get into all that training stuff later, but here I just want to get the feed forward algorithm to work. Off I go. All right, so here's a fun, and, I, and I'm realizing, oh, I made all these matrix videos to make my little matrix library, and now I'm realizing there's something I really kind of needed, which is that, I mean, I'm kind of going to be okay with it here, but I think it would be really convenient if my, when I make a matrix, if I could make one from an array. And so, what I want, just really quickly, I, I don't like the positioning of this because basically what I want to do is this, um, this input, I want to be able to feed input into the neural network and I, I, I expect that the input is going to come in from a one-dimensional array in JavaScript. Like I'm going to generate an input because I pulled it from a spreadsheet or something, and, but I need to quickly take that and make it into a matrix that has one row and one column in many rows. So I need to add a function and I'm going to make it a static function in this little matrix library. I guess I'll put it where I'm going to call it static from array and I'm going to assume that I receive an array. So how do I do that? What I need to do is I need to make a matrix that has the number of rows based on that array and one column. I need to make a matrix object and then I can just say for um, let i equal zero, i is less than the array's length, i plus plus, and I can say m dot data index i index zero equals array index i. Now there's probably some and then I can return this matrix. There's probably, again, I'm sure there's some way of using slice or something just to like sort of put the array in the right spot, but this is my long-winded way to say, okay, if I have a one-dimensional array, let's make a matrix that has the number of rows for each spot in that array, one column, and then let's quickly put all the values from the array in all the spots in all those rows. All right, so we've got that. So if we have that, that assumes now I can call this feed forward function input. And what do I need to do? Well, first of all, this neural network needs a weight matrix. I need a weight matrix. 
I need a weight matrix that stores the number of weights, all the weights that connect all the input neurons with the hidden neurons. And so I'm going to call that this dot input, uh, let's call this weights input hidden. Now, naming is not my strength, so I might come back and refactor the name for this later. I could look up what it's called in uh, this book that I've been, again, using to like, learn a lot of this stuff, and I'll reference again three, one, three Blue, One Brown's video. If you haven't watched the one about what is a neural network, you might want to watch that first. I'm implementing the code, a lot of it based on the explanation in that video. But I need all the weights that connect the inputs to the hidden, and this is a new matrix that has how many columns and how many rows? How many rows and how many columns is the way I should ask it, because rows comes first. Well, for every input, I need a, oh wait, I, oh, boy, I don't, I, I, like, I, it melted out of my brain. Uh, let me, let, this is gonna be a little edit point for you, Matteo, I make sure I get this right. So we, this is I is the row. J is the column. So I need the number of rows are the number of um, the number of rows are the number of inputs and the number of columns. Why have, I, why have I lost my mind here? Oh, no, this, there's hidden. This, okay, is the number, of, the number of rows is the number of hid, col, of, is the number of inputs, the number of columns is the number of hidden neurons. Right? Okay. I need a weight matrix that has a number of rows based on how many inputs there are and a number of columns based on how many hidden neurons there are. And I kind of did a poor example of making this two by two so I don't ever see the difference. But again, if there were another input, I would just have another row right here of this, of this particular, um, of this particular uh, matrix. Okay. So I need to say this dot input nodes, comma, this dot hidden nodes. That's telling me the dimensions of the matrix. Stop fact check. Didn't I get, I got it the wrong way around, didn't I? I didn't even come over to this screen. I totally got it the wrong way around. Ah. Come back to that again. Oh, this is, so, the indices, they're so hard. You know, if I, if I were just doing this by myself in my office without like all these people watching me on the live stream, totally not make any mistakes. It's very, I, I swear, I swear, I swear. I, I affirm, really. Um, all right, so if, if there were another one of these, right, zero, zero, there would be another column because there's only, let's think about if there's only two here. No. I'm getting confused. This is the, in, this is the inputs. Ah, this is not the, in, there would be another, there was another input. There would be a third one here. So I would need the number of columns here to match the number of rows here, so I would need another column here. I would need another column here. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. Go to the barber shop. Yeah, the, the weight of, I think the weight of my hair and beard is like dragging my brain slowly out of through my ears. So I need to make that weight matrix have Let's think about this. If I added another, so this is, I kind of did a problem here, a little bit of a flaw here, where because this is two by two, as square, it's so easy to like get mixed up. But think about it, if there were another input, then I would need another column of weights so that the number of 
uh, the number of rows matches the number of columns here. So I should have the number of columns is the number of inputs I have, and the number of rows is the number of hidden nodes. So the weight matrix has the number of rows, that is the hidden nodes, and the number of columns, that is the input nodes. And it's, so this is, this is the number. When I create this neural network that's a three layer network, I'm gonna set up the total number of inputs, the total number of hidden, not hidden layers, nodes in one hidden layer, and then total number of output nodes. And we'll see why you might wanna have just more than one output node. Okay, so th those are the weights. Now, I might as well, while I'm here, create the weights for between hidden and output. So again, I'm gonna think about the naming for this stuff later, but the weights between input and hidden, now I want the weights between hidden and output. And in this case, the number of columns is determined by the hidden nodes, and the number of rows is determined by the output nodes. So I have these two different weight matrices. Pause. So fact check me, I got that right, right? Right? <laughs> I'm waiting for someone to tell me that I got it right before I move on. I probably should just have a little more confidence in myself. Today I feel like I have very little confidence in myself. Okay, seems correct is good enough for me. Okay, now I should also add in the bias. I, mean, I don't know why, but I'm sort of like a kind of, I'm kind of like, I'd like to come back to the bias. Let's <laughs> add it at the end. Let's do the feed forward algorithm for a second, just without the bias. And let's add that in in a little bit. So a couple things, one is, how do you seed the weights of a neural? When I create a neural network, the whole point is I need to start with some set of weights. And I'm gonna just start with random weights. So I'm gonna say this.weights ih dot randomize. And this dot weights H O randomize. So I want to just put random weights in there. Again, the whole point of doing this is to learn the optimal rates. I'm going to get to that in future videos, but I need to start somewhere. And by the way, this is another area of active research. Like, well, how do you initialize? Are there good starting places? Like if you can start from a good place, are you going to have better results? And random, you know, one thing, one improvement that, I, that I've seen that I can make is I could just use like a Gaussian distribution of random numbers. I should while I'm here though, probably, under randomize at least in that matrix function. I think what I want is not, I, before I just made it um, uh, random numbers between, uh, oops, sorry, I have the wrong thing clicked here. Random numbers between zero and 10, but this needs to change. I really wanna have random numbers, I'll say uh, times two minus, uh, let's just do, let's actually say minus 0.5. So that'll give me starting weights between negative five, or, you know, whatever. I'll do times two minus one, times two minus one. So that should give me random numbers between negative one and one. So just to start with somewhere, this is a good starting point for me having random weights. Whoops, okay. All right, so now what can I do? I can say let the, let the input, I'll call it input layer equal matrix dot from array input. So I first need to make the in, I need to make that a matrix. And then I wanna say, let the hidden layer equal matrix multiply, what do I wanna do? I wanna multiply, the weight matrix times the inputs. This dot weights between the inputs and the hidden times the input layer. Now, this I'm gonna do, this, this formula, right? 
I kind of just did this part of the formula. So I need to add the bias, which I'll come back to, and pass it through the activation function. But I think I'm going to do this in multiple lines of code. It's going to make it a little bit simpler. So I'm going to put a comment here right now. I'm going to say hidden, I'm going to put a comment like add in the bias. And then I'm going to say hidden layer dot map sigmoid, right? I need to take that hidden layer and apply the sigmoid function to it. So I can use that map function that I wrote in the matrix library that takes a function and applies it to every single, right? This is doing the weighted sum. This is creating the weighted sum. And now, I'm, I, now I uh, apply the sigmoid function. Now this is the, if I run this code, it's going to say, I don't know what the sigmoid function is. So this is an area where what I need to do is write the sigmoid function. And again, as what I'm going to do probably later with this library is allow you to create a neural network that doesn't know, that can operate with different activation functions. There might actually be a variable inside the neural network that just called the activation function. But in this case, I'm going to write a function called sigmoid that takes x and then it returns what? Let's actually go and look at, again, I have it right here, 1 divided by 1 plus e to the negative x. So I believe in JavaScript, I can say 1 plus, wait, wait, what is that? 1 divided by 1 plus, and then I can, from the math library, the math library actually has, let's look at this, JavaScript math exp. This particular function returns e to the x. So this is actually such a common function that it's there built into the JavaScript library, but it returns e to the x. I need to make it negative. So x component, uh, um, exp negative x. So this should be the sigmoid function. So now I have the sigmoid function. I've mapped it, and that's now the hidden layer. Now, the outputs are equal to matrix. Wow, we're like almost done with this. We did so much work up until this point. Multiply this dot weights between what? The hidden and the output times what? Times what? The outputs of the hidden layer, which is right here. This is what I've now done. Hidden layer, and then I can just return outputs. Now, realistically, I might want to return the outputs back as an array. So technically speaking, right, uh, we know that the inputs is an array, the weights are in a matrix, the outputs of the hidden layer are in an array, times the, and then the, these weights are in a matrix, and then the output is an array. In this case, it might just be one number. So what I could do is I just want the first column. So can I say uh, outputs, Oh, I'm gonna, oh I, I'm gonna say two array. <laughs> Hold on. I, I didn't come back to the right screen anyway. And that went off. Hold on. How are we on time here? 1240. Oh, I forgot about it, sigmoid. Oh, and I forgot about sigmoid. Okay. What did I do? What's an easy way to turn the outputs? Because it's the second, the column is the second dimension in the array. How can I turn that? I guess I could transpose it. That seems crazy though. Um, I'll, I should, guess I could write a two array function. Uh, uh, it's like almost 80 degrees. Can you see that I'm sweating? It's like almost 80, 80 degrees in this room. Um, come back. All right, once I've multiplied the weights times the output of the hidden layer, I also need to apply sigmoid. And now I could just say return output. Like this is it. The input comes in, turn it into a matrix, create the hidden outputs by multiplying the weights, map 
activating with the sigmoid function, then do the next weights to do the output, activating the sigmoid function, return the output. But I kind of want, if I'm, send, if I'm the end user of this library and I'm sending in an array for the inputs, I kind of want to get an array back as the outputs. So let's write a silly function uh, to array, which just takes any matrix and puts all the values into a one-dimensional array. Uh, <laughs> And um, so I need to add that also to my matrix library, which I can do um, uh, to array. And what I want to do there is let array equal an array. And then if I just go through everything and say array.push this dot data. Now, I, I, I guess I should be careful about how I'm doing this. I know how I want to do this if it's a matrix that's one dimensional. I just want to have these in an array, this one first, this one second. But if it's like this, I probably want to do column, column, then the next row, column, column, which is exactly what I'm doing here, the columns in the inner loop. So that should be fine. And then say return array. So this now is a function, and again, there's probably some magical, fancy, functional programming array functions that I could do to, to make this more elegant, but this should work. All right, so guess what? <laughs> We're done, except I remember I said I have to add in the bias. And where, I have, to, I have to add in the bias here. Add in the bias. So this is, this is compute output of hidden layer right here. And this is compute output of output layer. Um, so the only thing I'm missing now is the bias. What is the bias? The bias is another matrix just like um, just like the input. So for each layer, it's just a one-dimensional array, you know, one column, uh, one column multiple row matrix of random values. And how I pick those random values and how we train the random values, that's coming. But let's come back to here. And I can say, I'm going to now also add this dot hidden bias equals a new matrix that has the number of hidden nodes for columns, for rows, and one column. And this dot output bias is the number of output nodes and one column. So why do we need, we need a hidden bias and an output bias? Why do we not need an input bias? Well, again, even though this is three layers, this isn't really a layer in the, in the truest sense. It's just the actual raw input values. As those go into the, in, the hidden layer, all of that math is applied with the bias. As that output comes into the output layer, all the math is applied with the bias for our final output. OK, so I should be able to also say now this.hiddenbias.randomize. And again, we might want to randomize the bias values in a completely different way. But in this case, I'm not going to worry about that. Output bias dot randomize. And now, where do we need to add that in? I need to say oh, hidden. Look, we did the add, hidden layer dot add hidden bias. Look at that. Oh, so simple because we did all this work already, right? We have a matrix library that has an add function that if you get an instance of another matrix, you just add all the corresponding values. If you get, um, if you get an instance of a matrix, you just add all the corresponding values. So this is exactly what we want to do. And oops, and it's done for us. Add the hidden bias. And then here, with the outputs, add the output bias. So I think, strangely enough, I'm done with this feed-forward algorithm. By no means am I done whatsoever with this series about building a neural network somewhat from scratch in JavaScript. But I think I am truly done in terms of this particular algorithm. Now, here's the thing. 
uh, this video is going to end. The next video, ostensibly, I'm going to start looking at how to do the training process and I'm going to use the XOR problem as a very simple problem to start with. I wouldn't be surprised if I've made some mistakes here or want to fix some things up here. So if that occurs and I get some comments and some feedback, I will uh, actually have another video where I do some cleanup or some alterations here before I get to that. So the next video is either going to be the learning part or, or the... Um, or fixing up this part. But let's actually at least make sure I don't have any syntax errors. We can't know whether we've gotten a good result or not because we have no test data to work with. We haven't done the training part yet. But I can at least now, if I run this live, if I, let's, let's, let's go to my sketch. I could write some test code. So I could say, hey, I want to have a neural network, call it NN, be a new neural network that has two inputs, two hidden nodes and one output node, right? And then what I want to do is create some inputs like 0, 1. And then I want to get the output, the outputs to be neural network feed forward inputs, right? See, this is the idea. Here we go, machine learning, or as I like to say, Trashim perning. But anyway, um, uh, I make the neural network object. My inputs are some data. Maybe that's eventually going to be some project that I'm really interested in that has exciting and interesting data that I've been thoughtful about and collected carefully and been transparent about how, where that data comes from and how it works. But all that aside, here's my test data, 0, 1. I want to feed that data into the neural network and I want to look at the output. So now I'm going to say console.log outputs. So here we go. Let's just see what happens. <laughs> ah! Input is not defined sketch line 7. Oh, I need an S there. That wasn't so bad. Uh, uh, all right, all right, all right. Ah! Oh. I think this one is the sketch.js line seven. Oh, input nodes. What the? No, that's not a this dot. I just assumed I had a this dot somewhere. I really shouldn't. I should never ever use this drum sound effect. It only means I have terrible errors. <laughs> this might be. This might be this dot. This is definitely a. because I need to multiply in the hidden bias and the output bias. The sigmoid is not this dot because I just defined it as a global function sigmoid just to be able to use it arbitrarily anywhere. But um, uh, so hopefully this is right now. Wait, someone sent me line 33. Oh, out, this should be outputs. Thank you, you saved me from another error. Okay, let's see, here we go. Hey! Oh! <laughs> you just watched a like very long, convoluted, poorly explained video about neural networks and all you got was this number. So I'm going to make a t-shirt that says, I just watched your YouTube video and all I got was 0 0.21037933718688034. So we don't really know if I did it correctly because I haven't like done anything to test this. And so if I find out I made some mistakes, I'm sure I will hear about them in the comments, but I will certainly correct them in the next video. Thank you for watching. <laughs> okay. Woo. <laughs> yeah, someone please make that. I definitely want to make that t-shirt. Uh, um, that I think would be a new Patreon level. Yes. Our password. Um, Thank you, Simon is telling me that I could uh, transpose, I could call the transpose function and then uh, just take zero. But um, uh, okay. Hello, Lebanon. It's amazing that someone from Lebanon is watching. I love the internationalness of this audience. Okay, so it is uh, in some ways the end of today's live stream. However, it is not. Because <laughs> even though it's like, 79 degrees Fahrenheit in this room. 
apologies for being. Now the, the other thing is, I'm going to want to use the whiteboard for my coding challenge. I don't think there's anything here that I really need to save. So I'm going to do the image stippling coding challenge before I leave. I like to have four. I like to make four, like each live stream to make four standalone videos. My goal is like live stream on Friday, new video Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's kind of my goal for the channel. Um, so if you don't mind listening to my erase the whiteboard music. <laughs> I totally should, I kind of love the idea of that t-shirt. And I, so I definitely feel like the video where I wrote the code is fine, but it's possible I should redo the whole explanation video. I will wait and see. I've definitely made worse. Mathieu has edited together videos with many more mistakes and confusion than that one. Relu. I won't have time today to um, do a video about Jekyll and how to contribute to the new Coding Train website that I showed at the beginning of this live stream. Um, but there is a lot of information about it on the GitHub repository, and I would love contributions uh, in the form of code or visual design or interaction design. So please consider that as something if you have some time and are looking to learn about contributing to an open source project. Okay. I should get a fan. I, I need to send an email and figure out, because maybe the climate control is actually not on in this room. All right. Thank you for that snapshot of the whiteboard, Matthew Braun. Perfect. All right, ah, question. What's a good sample image for me to use uh, for doing um, this? Oh, a cat. Oh, I'll use one of my kittens. It's not one of my kittens. Where are all those images? Sorry, I'm, Alka, yes, I am implementing a dither algorithm. So this isn't really maybe an image stippling challenge. I'm gonna do a dithering challenge. And then I'll, maybe I'll do a part two of, um, a part two. So this is Floyd Steinberg dithering, is what we're gonna do. And I need to find the cats I had from, where were those cat images? They were in the like um, kittens. This is, here we go. Oh, these are like low resolution, because I'm, well, Chrome extensions, here we go. Kittens. All right. We're gonna do a straw poll <laughs> for picking the kitten. One, 
Like, are these actually numbered? Uh, you know what? I'm just going to pick. Nonsense. One, two, three, uh, four, oh, five. No, there's only four. I'm trying to think of what's going to work best. This one's probably going to work best. I think this one probably works best for the um, for doing a, a coding challenge. All right. So let me quickly make a. I want it to be square. Oh, why won't it give me a pixel values in both? Oh, oh so annoying. All right. I have this nice little pre. Oh, it is. Uh, I just can't see it. 2666, 384. Wait, no. <laughs> ah! Hold on, let me just get something relatively close to getting the cat. This is too many pixels. Let me, hold on. Let me make a copy of this. Kitten. Uh, tools, image size. Uh, just like it like a thousand or something. It's twelve hundred just so I have more to work with than zero. And now <laughs> this is like the worst way to make something a square. If I just open up Photoshop, I know how to do it. Six six fifty three, four, five, six, five. Three, there we go. Crop. <laughs> Close enough. Tools adjust size. 512. There we go. There's my kitten. Oh, I could do shift for square? Oh, I'm the worst. Oh, it makes it a square. Thank you, Alka. Amazing. Let's go from here and do this. It's so hot in here, I cannot even express to you. I'm opening the door while well, I'm just doing the setup here. Kitten, I need to save, save this now. I need to open up processing. Can't believe how much time I spent <laughs> trying to. Uh... So, is high contrasts. Yeah, I think this will work contrast wise. I think this will work. Um, so I'm going to call this dithering. Dithering, dithering, dithering. Oh, you know what? I'm kind of wearing the perfect shirt for this. And since it's so hot in here anyway. Hopefully audio wise this won't affect things too much. See here. Um, how's the sound? The sound okay? Is the sound okay? My wife gave me this shirt. Need that kitten image. Where did I save that kitten image? Documents, downloads. Uh, desktop, dithering. Uh, new folder. Uh, okay. All right. Ten challenges left before coding challenge number 100. Oh boy. All right, so let me think about this. What is, let me understand, what is the true definition of image stippling? Creation of a pattern simulating varying degrees of solidity or shading using small dots. 
So this is, the, the, this particular dithering algorithm is a form of stippling, but I think almost what's more interesting, an example of image stippling is like, um, let me look up at Robert Hodgen. Why do I keep closing that door before I'm ready? You're closing that door before I'm ready. It's like a reflex. Oh uh, yeah, here we go. So these are some interesting examples which I will reference. And then I will look at this algorithm and then this. Okay, okay. And dithering is, what's the definition of dithering besides this? <laughs> Be indecisive, yeah, add white noise, huh, dither. Yeah, okay. Look at this, the same thing, one bit dithering. Okay. Noise to random quantization error. Blah. All right. All right. Ah, who cares about these definitions? All right. I'm ready for this challenge. Gradation using dots. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Is Alka a real person? <laughs> it's all a good question. Okay. Let's get some air in here. Okay. Here we go. Hello, welcome to today's coding challenge. Today's coding challenge is to implement Floyd Steinberg dithering. Dithering, dithering, dithering. And I'm going to do this dithering, which is the thing that I actually spend most of my day just dithering about. Um, I'm gonna do this dithering in uh, processing which is a Java-based uh, program environment, works great for graphics, I can load images, I can manipulate pixels, which is what I need to do. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is because I'm interested in this overall topic of image stippling, which is a way of making an image basically out of dots. And just as one reference for this, I'm gonna show you the work of Robert Hodgen, um, did some interesting attempts to do uh, image stippling using like particle systems moving around and forces between the particles. And I'd love to think about that as a follow-up. But I'm going to, in this video, look at a particular dithering algorithm, a way of quantizing an image and looking at errors, and I'll kind of get to that as I go through it, um, to get this type of look for an image. But I do want to think of this, for at least for you, as a beginning step, because if I could make this what if I consider all these dots to be particles that can move and experience physics and um, turn, go and find another place for another image? There's a lot of possibilities there. So let's get started. So I have a blank processing sketch and in the folder I have a data folder and I have this image of a kitten which is 512 by 512 pixels. So the first thing that I want to do is I just want to write a simple sketch where I um, have a P image object called kitten. And then I say kitten equals load image. Uh, and the name of the file is kitten.jpg. And I am going to make a window that is 1024 by 512 so that I can uh, draw the image of the kitten at z on the left hand side. And if I run this, we should see, oh boy, that image is, that kitten is not 512 by 512. <laughs> I must have messed something up. So let me go in here and say tools, adjust size, uh, 512. There we go. It's a little smaller. And there we go. So what I want is I want to be able to look and see, see, a, the, see the original kitten here, and then I want to see the dithered kitten on the other side. So how does this algorithm work? Well, fortunately for me, I'm on this Wikipedia page, which explains it, and it's got it right here. But before I get to that, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that have to happen. For example, in the pseudocode, there's like this line that says, find closest palette color. Hmm, what's that mean? And then there's like this quant error thing. So let's discuss sort of on the whiteboard, what some of these pieces are. So if I have an image, an image is just 
a grid of pixels, any given pixel having a column row location, and I might think of that as x comma y, right? It's in the x column, 0, 1, 2. It's in the y row, 0, 1, 2. <laughs> Amazingly, I picked the pixel 2 comma 2. And it has a color. Typically, that color is going to be an RGB color, meaning it's going to have some red value, some green value, and some blue value. The idea of quantizing an image, so typically speaking, if I'm using the full range of digital color, I have a lot of possibilities. I have 0 to 255, 256 possible reds, 256 possible greens, and 256 possible blues. But what if I wanted to reduce the number of possibilities? What if there were only four reds, 0, 1, 2, and 3? Four greens, I would have, and, and, I, have, and I take an image of an original color, um, take an image of, um, that has the original full colors and I reduce it to a smaller subset of colors. And this kind of process is applied to, uh, to, to make images more, smaller file sizes and, and to do various kinds of effects. So actually, let's just do that first. And actually, what I'm going to do is quantize this image so that there's only two possible colors. There's basically 0 red or 255 red, 0 green or 255 green, and 0 blue or 255 blue. So there's really 2 times 2 times 2 possible colors, 8 possible colors. So instead of 256 to the third power colors, I want to see what does this image look like with just 8 possible colors. Let's make that happen first. And we'll see later why that's part of this algorithm. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to operate on the same kitten image. So what I'm going to do is load the original image and display the original image in setup, then operate in on it and display the new image in draw. Uh, you know, I, there could be some animation stuff that I do or a different order, but I'm going to do that as a simple thing for right now. <laughs> okay, so let's, the first thing that I need to do is I need to look at all of the pixels. And here's the thing, even though I could just, the pixels are stored in a one-dimensional array, so, but I do want to say, look at all the x values. Um, kitten, and, and based on that image's width, sorry, I, I lost my, what I was doing here for a second. So I need a nested loop to look at every pixel. For every x and for every y. So this is going to allow me to look at a given pixel from the kitten. The problem is the pixels are actually stored in a one-dimensional array. <laughs> and I need, and I want to think about the pixels as their x, y positions, because I'm going to need that later. Luckily for us, there's a very simple formula, x plus y times kitten dot width. And I go through this formula in another video that I will link to from this video's description if you want to understand why this formula takes an xy position and gives me the one-dimensional location in the pixel array. So here's the thing. In order to quantize this image, this color, this color variable is actually just a big integer. And I need to pull out the red value uh, of the pixel, the green value of the pixel, and processing has these nice helper functions that if I just pass an RGB color to the red function, I get the red value and the blue value of the pixel. Now, how can I quantize the image? Basically, what I want to say, it's kind of like a threshold effect. I want to say, if the, if the range of colors between 0 and 255, if I'm above 127, just make it 255. If I'm below 127, just make it 0. And so I could use an if statement for that, but there's actually kind of a fancy way I could do this. Let's say I take, so I'm going to say, um, I'm going to have the new R is going to be equal to, um, let's say I take the current R value and divide it by 255. What does that give me? That gives me a number between 0 and 1. Well, what if I just round that number? So if that number is 0.5, it'll be 1. If that number is... 0, below 0.5, it'll be 0. So I can actually use the round function, and then I can just multiply it by 255. So this is basically giving me two, only two possible numbers. No matter what r is, I'm either going to get 0 or 255. And I can do the same exact thing for g. 
and the same exact thing for b. And now, what am I going to do? I want to say kitten.pixels index equals a new color with those values. So this is me just saying pull the RGB values out, quantize them to a smaller number of possibilities, make a new color, and set it back to the pixels. OK. So, and you know, I've forgotten something kind of important, which is that when I operate on an image in processing before I oper operate on the pixels, I should say kitten.updatePixels, and then when I'm done, I should say kitten. No, no, no. Update pixels is when I'm done. And before I operate on the pixels, I need to say load pixels. Like load pixels is saying like, hey, hey, you, I want to work on the pixels right now. Update pixels is saying, hey, I'm done. Eh, eh, yeah, I, uh, my image processing algorithm is, eh, eh. But um, I'm done. I'm done. So now, image kitten 512 comma 0. So I should see the quantized version on the right and the original image on the left. Let's see. This looks pretty good, right? This kind of makes sense. Like, if I only have a certain number of possibilities, this is what I'm left, oh, left over with. We can, you know, let's, well, interestingly enough, what happens if I were to, uh, right before I do any of this, make it grayscale? So I can just quickly filter that image and make it grayscale with a filter function and processing. We can run it again. And we can see, you can see how this is working. Now there's only two possibilities. It's either white or black. And so this is identical to a thresholding effect. And here, oh, oh whoops, let's, let's leave that in but comment it out. Because we'll come back to it later. Now, interestingly enough, while we're here, what if I want to have more possibilities? Oops. Since I had a little pause there, let me see. Um, okay, let me just check in the chat to see if I've made something weird. Okay. What if I want to have more possibilities? What if I actually want to have, instead of just two possibilities for each color, four possibilities for each color? Well, I can do something similar. For example, what I could do, I think this would work, right? What if I multiply this by 4, and then divide it by this, and divide 255 by 4. Let, let me just put this in here. Usually I don't like to do this, and then let me explain it. Think about this. What I'm going to get now is if I'm multiplying this number that's a floating point number between 0 and 1 by 4, and I round it, I'm going to get a 0, 1, 2, or 3. Right? Those are the only things I'm going to get, 0, 1, 2, or 3. Now, I want to scale that up to basically like what are four possible colors in between 0 and 255. So this also, oh, and this I was going to say I have to put floor here, but luckily I don't. And this is going to really trip us up later if I'm not careful. Um, RGB are floats, so this is going to turn into a float. Round will turn the result back into an integer, 0, 1, 2, or 3. Can I get four? Yeah, I could get four here. This is actually giving me five possibilities, right? Because if r is zero, I'm going to get zero. So this is actually interestingly enough giving me five possibilities. Zero, one, two, three, four, or four. Five possibilities. Just like multiplying it by one <laughs> gave me two possibilities, zero or one. So I actually have five possibilities here. And then I want to scale that up. This, though, this is an integer. This is an integer. It's going to give me an integer back. So. Um, and what I might like to do here, just to be like protect myself here a little bit, is I might want to say new, new r. And I want these to be sure that these are integers because I'm quantizing to just a few sets of possibilities. So this is indeed, uh, this is indeed an integer. And so now, um, so now I'm going to say a new r new g, new b, new b. So let's now run this and see what happens. There. You can see how now I have more color possibilities, but still I've reduced the image to a smaller number of colors. Uh, five, five, this was actually 5 times 5 times 5. So um, 
125 possible colors, I think. Not very many colors. Um, okay, I should probably make this a variable. I'll call it like factor. Um, and I'll set that equal to four and put this in here. And the same number goes here if I've done this correctly. And if we run this, it looks like this. If I set this to be one, it looks like this. So this makes it, if I want to do something interactive here, I wouldn't want to operate on the original kitten image. I want to have a separate image so I could like change it on the fly, but I don't need that for right now. Okay, so we've done the quantizing part. Now, the other thing that I need to understand is the quantization error. Is that the right way to say that? I'm not entirely sure. But what I mean by that is, let's say the actual, let's look at a particular example. The actual color is 255, comma 100, comma 10. Oops, I don't want to put This is an actual color. Or if I were to reduce this color with one, with two levels, with a factor of one, two levels, I would get 255, zero, zero, right? Because this would round up to 255, this would round down to zero, and this would round down to zero. So the error is the difference between these two. This minus this is zero, this minus this is 100, and this minus this is 10. That's the actual error. Let's, let's, let's do this a little bit differently. Let's make this 150, just so we can see. So this would then be 10, but this would round up to 255, so the error would be negative 105, right? So you can see this is calculating the error. The reason why I need to work with this error, and let's put this into the code real quick. So I'm going to say here, er error r equals new uh, r minus new r. Error g equals g minus new g and uh, error b equals b minus new b, new b. Okay, so, um, so the reason why I need this error is, let's go back to that Wikipedia page. Basically, this algorithm achieves dithering, dithering using error diffusion, meaning it pushes the residual quantization error of a pixel onto its neighboring pixels to be dealt with later. So in other words, it just keeps, ah, it's so different, put it on, it's kind of, it keeps pushing the colors further and further apart away from each other, kind of based on the error. And so the pixel indicated with a star indicates the pixel currently being scanned, and this is the amount of error it passes to its neighbors. So in this case, ooh, and what's kind of, the order matters here for each Y from top to bottom for each X, because I'm actually pushing the error based on pixels to the right, so actually, so uh, um, the, the pixels that I'm using are pixels, this is a pixel to the right, this is a pixel to the left and down, this is a pixel down, it's kind of like the pixels on the bottom right of the image. So um, let's check this out, for each Y from top to bottom, no I have X, so I need to do Y first, that's going to make a difference. So right now, let's just make sure this still works, it still works, but now I need to start doing this error thing. So for each, so now this is what I've done already, right? I've gotten the, the, the quantized pixel, like I've done this part and I've calculated the error. So all I need to do is start like funneling the error off. Okay, so how do I do that? Let's actually grab this and put it in our code right here. And let's comment it out. Comment that out, and let's put this up here, right? This, in fact, is that whole first part of the algorithm. This whole first part of the algorithm matches exactly with these three lines of code right here, right? I look at the old pixel, I get a new pixel, and I set it, and then I find the error. So I've done that already. Now I just need to do this part. So doing this part is, hmm, so, First, I need to say, uh, okay, so here's the thing. Let's, you know how I have this formula here? X plus Y times kitten dot width. Let's make that actually a function. I'm gonna call the function index, and it just takes an int, an integer, uh, a X and a Y. It should probably take a width too, but I'm gonna um, be sort of silly about it. 
and it's just going to return, because I'm going to need to do this a lot, x plus y times kitten dot width. Y, oh, and it's not a void function, it returns an integer. And then I'm going to do this, index x comma y. So what I'm going to do is like whenever I have an x, y, I could just quickly get the index and return it, and that will be the correct index into the pixels array. I could have made this two lines of code, to, but I think, I think we can follow this. I can follow this. Hopefully you can follow this. Um, because the reason why I just did that is because I need to say kitten.pixels index x plus 1 comma y, right? I am rewriting exactly this pseudocode right here. And y, uh, uh, okay? So that's, so I need to do this to x plus 1 comma y. I need to do this to x minus 1, y plus 1. I need to do this to uh, x, y plus 1. And I, I'm sure I could do this in some kind of like loop or something, but I'm just going to write it all out right now just to know that it works. x plus 1, y plus 1. So, and like if I just for a second put zeros here, just so I don't have any syntax errors, and put a semicolon here, semicolon, let's just see. Okay, great. So this is what I'm doing, and I'm going to be kind of anal retentive about this and add some extra spaces um, just so it all lines up. So I know I need to operate on these four pixels. That's what it's telling me down here. And what do I need to do? This is the important part. Ah, so this gets, the, the, if you can see that these are all getting parts of the error. 7 plus 3 plus 5 plus 6 is 16. So this is getting like, you know, almost half the error, like 40, high 40s percent. This is getting like a little bit around, a little less than a quarter of the error. So, okay, so this amount is important. So for each one of these, I actually need to make a new color. So I need to say, um, so I need to, hmm, hmm, hmm. Ah, I'm gonna have to do this with R. I have to, for everything I have to do this with an R, a G, and a B. So, um, oh, and this is gonna be index xy here as well. So now what I need to do is, let's think about this. I want to get um, a, another new r. I already used the variable name new r and I already called it an integer. So, ah, let's, okay. Let's say, um, I'm gonna, okay, let's, I'm gonna have a color called c. I, I have an idea now. I'm gonna rename, just to, so I have different variable names, I'm make this old r, old g, old b, sorry for all this variable naming, ugh, old r, old g, old b, and then old, old, old. Okay, so <laughs> the reason why I'm doing that is because this is what I want to do. Ah. I'm going to actually say int index equals this index. Then color is kitten.pixels that index. Now kitten.pixels that index should now equal r equals red, c, red of c, g equals green of c, b equals blue of c. It should equal, and that r should now equal, <laughs> I got it, I got it, I got it. r should equal itself plus error r times 7 divided by 16. Times 7 divided by 16. Do you see why this is? So what I need to do is I need to do this for r, g, and b. g, b. g, b. g, b. So what, I, and I have a mistake here, but for each one of these, and now I set it back to the color. I'm passing the error. So let me look at that color, get its RGB, pass part of the error onto it, and then set that new color. Okay? So the thing that's wrong with this is 7 divided by 16 is what? It's, I said it was like almost 50%, almost 0.5, but it's actually 0 because both of those are integers. So I need to be very car careful and say 16.0. I need to at least explicitly in Java, in JavaScript I wouldn't have this problem, I need to explicitly say 0.0 because I want that to be a float. So now I just need to do this 
with every single one of these. So I need to do this over and over again, four times. And each time I do it, I'm going to just use the same variable names, but not redeclare them. I don't love this style, but it will do. So now I need, the next one is x minus 1, y plus 1. And the next amount of error I want is 3 comma 16. 3 divided by 16. So 3. So I'm going to do that. Then I'm going to do what? The next one is x, y plus 1 x, y plus 1, and the amount of error is 5 16th, x, y plus 1 is 5 16th. Then the last one, and I can get rid of all my notes here from the pseudocode. The last one is x plus 1, y plus 1, x plus 1, y plus 1, and 1 16th of the error. Okay. I think, yes, yes, I could make a function. I, there's so many ways this could be cleaned up, and I appreciate people who are watching this live giving me good feedback. I'm going to leave that as an exercise to the viewer. I just want to run this right now. Ah, okay, so I have an array in this. Oh, what is my problem here? Look at this. I am looking at every single pixel, but for every single pixel, I'm dealing with neighboring pixels, right? I'm dealing with things like, for this pixel's x, y, I'm dealing with x plus 1 comma y, which is this pixel. It's 1 over an x, the same y. But when I do this, there's no pixel over here. So I need to deal with the edges. And I could be thoughtful about this, but just to get this algorithm to work, let's look at these. I am going to the right and the left, but only to the right of y, only down y-wise. Why wise? So I can start x at 1. If I start at 1, I'll always have a neighbor to the left. And I can go all the way up to minus 1, meaning I always have a neighbor to the right. And for y, I can, I can start at 0 because I never look up. And I can go over this way. So now, let's run this. And I really should, I've learned my lesson so many times to not use this drum roll effect because I usually have some mistakes. But I'm going to try it right now. Hey! I think I kind of got this. Yeah, look. It's sort of hard to see because there's so much crazy detail in the outside here. But I think, did I leave the factor as one? I think this is right. You know what an easier way for me to see if this is right? Is let's filter out. Let's use the grayscale one and look at it. Yeah. It's definitely right. So you can see this image is now kind of dithered, so to speak. You could sort of ask the question, is it a lot of white dots? Is it a lot of white dots on a black background? Or is it a lot of black dots on a white background? The truth of the matter, it's neither. All I've done is set every pixel to either white or black. But I've made it have this appearance of being like a lot of dots next to each other. Um, and so the question here is, how might I take this, like if I used a lower resolution image, drew the dots as ellipses, and then blew it up, what kind of other visual effects could I get here? And we could see this. We could kind of look, you know, if I change the factor to 4, and ran it again, you know, you can see that it's the same sort of thing is happening. It's dithered, but I'm only, now I have, I think, five different gray possibilities. You can see white, um, white, dark, dark gray, light gray, <laughs> medium gray, no, dark, bright, great gray, I don't know what. <laughs> you get the idea. So I think, oh, bit rate is an issue here. So, ah, I think I've done something, which is that uh, this video is not going to work very well on YouTube <laughs> because you're not really going to be able to see this detail. But I think if I zoom in, right, I think you can, uh, can kind of see, hopefully you can see, see this detail. All right, so what could you do with this? I'm going to stop here. Um, I'm going to go back to um, uh, taking out gray. Let's look at it with, so you can see here this is dithered but now many different RGB colors, maybe 125 RGB possibilities, I think. Um, so what could you do with this? I, um, and uh, I'm going to actually leave the code with 1 and leave the grayscale in. What I think could be interesting is, number one, work with a much lower resolution image, but display it at much higher resolution, and maybe draw ellipses or particles as each one of these dots. 
whether it's a black dot or a white dot, draw it with some texture, some image or something. What if those dots somehow are the seeds of a particle system? And then I think eventually I want to come back. Maybe I'll do a follow-up challenge like that. But those would be some exercises that I would try. You can read over a link also to Robert Hodgins' description of this stippling. You can see the particle checks the pixel array to see what shade of gray it needs to re represent. If it shows blackness, it grows smaller and its magnetic charge diminishes. If it's white, it grows larger as does its charge. So this is kind of like a force-directed, self-organizing physics-based system that creates these uh, uh, white and black dots to represent an image. You know, and certainly, um, I will, tr uh, I will create or somebody will pull request for me a JavaScript version of this so that you can also see a version that runs in the browser. Although the pixel array works differently in HTML5 Canvas and in P5.js and pixel operations in the browser unless you're using shaders or some kind of advanced technique often are very, very slow. Whereas in, uh, in Java and processing, they can operate quite quickly. All right. Um, Thank you, everybody. Oh, if I stop moving, I'm told, if, just to show this to you, I'm told that if I zoom into it <laughs> and then I stop moving, it will resolve. This will be the thumbnail. Let's get the mouse out of there. This will be my thumbnail. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for watching. All right, everybody, I am finished today. Um, I'm finished today. Uh, it is 1.30, I do have to go. I haven't had lunch. <laughs> um, this has been a close to three hour live stream, which is usually about as much as I can handle. Um, <clears throat> I will read some random numbers, I don't know. I, I had the system where I was like going through it and remembering where I left off. So I don't know what to do about this random number thing. Maybe I need a new shtick. <clears throat> I think the cat image should be for <laughs> behind me here. I'll stand right here in the white area. 59,536. For those of you who are in Europe, actually Europe, it's only like, it's dinner time. Those of you who are somewhere in the world right now where it's bedtime, lie down, relax. I will read to you from the coding train bedtime story, a million random digits with 100,000 normal deviates. <clears throat> 12,520, 63,240, 69,088, 11,836, 63,935, 48,958, 93,046, 13,582. Boy, that was it. All right. Um, okay. Um, I will uh, take questions from the chat for about two, two and a half minutes. So you can post your questions in the chat now. Uh, I will remind you, ooh, pause. Let me just remind you, I don't have time to go through this in more detail, but codingtrain.github.io um, slash rainbow code. This is the new system for compiling uh, all, every single video, a page for each video, links relevant to the video, contributions from the community, the uh, live stream schedule, Everything now should be is on this new website, which is a GitHub repository, Rainbow Code. And uh, if you would like to contribute to it, uh, please um, take a look at these GitHub issues. I should probably label the ones that are website related as opposed to that are just like code example related. So that's something I should do. Um, and uh, you can also look on the wiki that has a guide for contributing. And I would love as much help as possible with this. Uh, thank you again to Niels Webb on GitHub who just had the idea to make this website. And it's amazing. And in particular, some visual design or interface design, user experience design, that I think um, would be uh, helpful. Okay, so in, uh, if you want to support the channel, you can go to patreon.com slash coding train. You will get an invitation to the um, uh, Slack group where I have my first question. What was your first computer? Good question. My first computer 
was an Apple II Plus. I believe I was in second grade at the time. Uh, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, it was an Apple II Plus, and I learned a little bit about programming in BASIC on it when I had it. I was not, I never really did programming more than just a tiny bit until I was uh, 28 or 29. <laughs> but in second grade, I did a little bit, and in seventh grade, I did a little bit. And I did BASIC in second grade, uh, yeah. Thank you, Gil, for your um, donation. I, I appreciate it. Did you take computer science in school? I did not. I have never taken a computer science course. I did take, I did go to the grad, the program here at ITP, where I took Introduction to Computational Media, which is a learn to program computer science-like course through the lens of media and art. But uh, <laughs> we'll go to the barbershop. What is your morning beard re regime? I take a shower and I wash. That's it. Uh, do I play any video games? Yes. I recently, I have two children, they are six years old and nine years old. Uh, we recently, over the holidays, acquired a Nintendo Switch. So far I have played a lot of Just Dance, Snipper Clippers, and Mario Kart. And today arrived in the mail uh, Mario, what's it, Super Mario Odyssey. So I've not played it yet, but I will play it this weekend. <laughs> Just toying around, especially for my, for all my Just Dance moves. I've, oh, I've learned some new dance moves. I have to switch to a different song. Um, what's a good one? This will work. This is a new dance move I learned. <laughs> From Just Dance. <laughs> Some other ones too, like... I, whatever, I can't do it. But I've been playing, I love Just Dance. It, the thing about the game that's ridiculous though, is unlike like a Kinect tracking game, which is doing some full skeleton, it's just kind of, I assume, using the accelerometer and the control that you hold in your hand. So you can almost do nothing and just move this one hand around and get just as good of a high score as if you did all the dance routines. Moves. All right, uh, that was about a minute in, I think. So I don't know, if people would watch a gaming channel for me and maybe with my kids involved, I'll consider it. Um, what does your school think of these videos and Patreon? Any legal issues others should know if they want to do something similar? I'm definitely operating in somewhat of a gray area here. I, there is an advantage, an, adva an advantage. I do have the benefit of being at an art school, so I think it's different. Um, uh, and so I consider this work that I do, you know, the. The, there's other departments here at Tisch, like the dance department and the film school and the tele, and a lot of people who teach make movies or make TV shows and I make YouTube videos and I'm in ITP. So I consider this an extension of my research and professional practice. It's complicated and confusing and uh, there's certain things that I probably am and am not allowed to do. I don't really know what those things are. I'm just experimenting and learning and when somebody tells me I can or cannot, I will rethink what I'm doing. But yeah, I do have a lot of support from my department ITP in learning about this and making videos and I really am also, uh, um, you know, I'm try I hope to use this channel as a place for other people to feature other people and, and tutorials and that type of thing as well. Um, um, are your children interested in programming? I guess I should just let this play while I'm talking because otherwise if I pause for every question, I'll never be done. Yes, they're, they're, they're interested. Um, you know, I, I think most of my time as a parent has been trying to keep them away from technology, at least as they were very, very little. I think the, there's, it's hard to replace the wonders of the physical world and the uh, companionship of other human beings. But, um, you know, now that they're, uh, you know, getting a little bit older and almost towards uh, middle school age, one of them at least, I think it's working with computers and learning about programming is a wonderful ex thing to do, not to the exclusion of other things, but um, could you write an OS if you wanted? I seriously doubt it. No. Can you do a JavaScript tutorial without P5? I probably could. And maybe I will, but I, you know, that's not really my wheelhouse so much, but I appreciate the thought. Um, can, what was your first programming language, asked Simon in the Slack group. My first programming language was basic when I did a little bit of it in second grade, but I think I just did it a tiny bit then. Then I, I, I believe in middle school I used assembly language uh, for a class that I took and maybe a little basic again. But then I didn't program all the way up until I was um, 
28 or 29, I have to look it up, I can't remember. And the first programming I learned then was actually with the Lingo programming language with Macromedia Director. And I recently got to meet John Henry Thompson, who created the Lingo programming language. Um, um, and uh, is, I, this is not his current website. Uh, oh, here it is, uh, who's amazing and is working on a lot of really interesting projects. If you don't know about John Henry Thompson, uh, learn about John Henry Thompson's work. So many things that I'm doing that we're doing now come directly from all the work that he did with the Lingo Programming Language, Macromedia Director, and many other things. And he's working on a project right now called DICE. I saw a presentation, a Distributed Instrument for Computed Expression. So I encourage you to check this out. It's wonderful. Uh, how old are you? 44. How is your elbow? It is doing much better. You can see my, I mean, I'm basically recovered, although I don't have full extension, but I do have full, um, and I, I still have a little weakness, and I'm still doing some physical therapy exercises, but I would say I'm pretty well. Um, all right, I've got to go now. I will just take these last two questions. Um, are you currently writing, planning new books? No. The three book projects that I would like to do if I had time were one, Nature of Code in JavaScript, which I may actually get to, a version of learning processing, but like an intro book, but with JavaScript. And the third one would be a book all about programming uh, with text as data. So algorithms for generating poetry or analyzing text and that kind of thing. So if I had time, that's what I would do. But uh, right now I need like a big block of time to just focus on something like that. So um, I speak a little bit of French. Okay, um, so anyway, uh, Thank you for watching, everybody. Um, I will see you next Friday. I expect next Friday will also be a morning time around this time, but stay tuned. I announce on Twitter. Uh, when I have a time, I post it on this new website, or, uh, you know, I make an in a slide, whatever. I try to announce everywhere and schedule it on YouTube as best as I can. So thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. The edited versions of all these videos will come out next week. And I look forward to seeing you all next time on YouTube. Goodbye.